Twilight Zone, the first time that we visited this beautiful city in Canada. We've got seven great fights, top of the bill, a 10 three-minute round fight between Samuel Vargas, someone who's familiar to British fans, and presents Law Runowski, who's also fought in Britain. He went there, fought Michael McKinson, Josh Kelly, went 10 rounds in both. It's a great top of the bill at this incredible venue. And you've, got, you've got to be here to witness how good it is in there. With me right now, Corey Herman, our commentator for the evening, the face of uh, Toronto Boxing. Corey, you're Mr. Toronto Boxing. Talk us through the cards. Well, you know our main event, of course, Sammy Vargas, who's really been a, a fixture on the Canadian scene for about a decade. And all of this, a lot of it can be attributed to Sammy Vargas. The fact that he has been on the world stage against many of the top welterweights of the last decade or so, he's been able to be a staple on the local Ontario scene and is one of the reasons why we can have events like this. He's going to be taking on Premislav Ranovsky in the main event. A really tough fight and oddly some continuity with what's happening next week with Virgil Ortiz and Michael McKinson, both former opponents of those two, this is kind of like the consolation bracket to see who can then get another chance on the top level. What is it for Sammy? You know, he brings us four out of his last six. Um, he was blown away and around by Connor Ben. I think he's reluctant to say, but would you call it last chance for the saloon for him? Absolutely. I think it's Sammy Vargas, and he would admit as much. I think he needs a win in this fight to stay in the conversation for those types of fights, to be able to get a chance to test another top-name prospect or to be an opponent for a top-name uh, welterweight out there, 154. He's going to need a win here tonight to remain in those conversations. Women's boxing is mushrooming. Um, Amanda Galley fighting for the Canadian Super Bantamweight title. Didn't quite win it last time. Uh, tell us a bit about Amanda and what sort of fight she's got tonight against Tanya Walton. Yeah, and realistically, the only reason Amanda Galley didn't win the title last time is because she didn't make 122 pounds. So she'll get another crack at the Canadian Super Bantamweight title. She'll be taking on Tanya Walters, who's an all-action inside fighter. She likes to bang away to the body. Stylistically, this one should be good. And Amanda Galley could quickly find herself in a conversation for bigger fights net 122 you have legends like Mariana Juarez and Jackie Nava waiting there at the top but she needs to conquer the domestic level first uh, tell us about the rest of the card you know there's guys from France there there's guys from all over the world France Mexico guys that have been outside their country are boxing here tonight yeah two international names that people want to look out for on this card here tonight Pierre Hubert de Bombay who's managed by Tony Bellew kind of oscillating between 168 and 175 look out for him in uh, one of our feature contest and Brian Acosta who's in the camp with Juan Francisco Estrada and Miguel Burchelt he's part of uh, that territory in Mexico now stationing his pro career here in Canada we're going to get another look at him here tonight as you know we're launching Fight Zone here today Fight Zone Canada tell us what Fight Zone can do for Canadian boxing well I think one important thing is this sets up a pipeline Steve for Canadian fighters to start challenging for the Commonwealth title again of course our viewers in the UK you know all the fights that happen for the Commonwealth title. We get some great domestic and, and uh, UK level fights. Canadian fighters are technically a part of that pipeline, but for years they really haven't been considered for those titles. And now, when you give fighters exposure on a platform like Fight Zone, it changes things. And can you tell us a bit more, who else is coming through in Canadian boxing right now? So I know there's another show here that's prospect filled in May. Yeah, well tonight we're going to get a look at Nick Fantuzzi, who's one of the best ticket sellers in Ontario tonight. We can keep an eye out for him, but historically Quebec has kind of been the hotbed, or at least over the last 20 years, for Canadian talent. There are so many great fighters coming out of Quebec right now. Oscar Rivas, the Bridgeway champion, Alita Alvarez making another run at 175 pound gold, uh, Kim Clavel, Maria Decaire on the women's side. There's a lot of talent here in Canada, and now Ontario has a bigger platform to showcase its prospects. Like in, 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 in Britain, we have you know English fighters beat Scottish and in intercity rivals, Liverpool beat Manchester, London, Manchester, London, Liverpool. Can you tell me, you know, is there ever, is there any inter country rivalry like that? Well, uh, Quebec versus Ontario historically has always been a great rivalry, and now that we have a bigger platform like a fight zone where we can cultivate this Ontario talent that can then go on and challenge the Quebec talent that does have that kind of platform and gets national exposure, I think we could be building to those types of rivalries. We could listen to you all night, but I know you're going to speak a lot tonight, so get back, get ready, and get ready to start commentating. A pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much, Steve.
famous faces um, to interview. I found one, Steve Crump, and with him, his mate, Dennis Hobson. Uh, fellas, um, how much do you love in Canada? First of all, Dennis. I think it's a great place, great people, and uh, we've been very, very warmly welcomed. I mean, Lee Baxter's a great host, and uh, the setup here is is, 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 is class, and uh, I think I think it's the future, and we're uh, we're so excited about working with with Lee, and uh, I think I think we're going to do big things together, Stephen. You can see how excited you are, Dennis. You even got up at 6:30 this morning to watch the undercard way, didn't you? Yeah, it was like Christmas Day for me because uh, you know it's something new, Steve. It's we 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 breaking into another frontier, and um, you know we want to develop Canada. Canada's Canada's untapped. It's um, and I think with what we're doing uh, on the back of Lee Baxter here, I think we're going to develop some world champions. You know, there've been some big names from here. You know, Burbick, Lennox Lewis is obviously the biggest name that's ever come from Canada, even though they were classed as British. But um, there's some talent here, and I think they just need a platform, and hopefully. Fizon is the platform for the future world champions. Steve, you're very key. I know Philip you're very Philip Wan the Zoolander. The Spain worldwide. So how important is it for you to be here today and cover, you know, be part of the Canadian market? Well, I think we've got to show Lee as much support as we can. You know, he's put a great effort in, and what a, what a fantastic stadium he's, he's started with. You know, and what what else is there better to do on a Sunday afternoon than uh, tune in and, and watch some fights? So. So I take me out to Lee, you know he's done a great job and, and if we can end support him and help him, whatever we do, if it's just by turning up then we're going to do it, you know, so he's got, he's got, I'm sure to speak on Dennis's behalf as well, he's got our full support. Would you like to see the situation where fighters from around Britain come over here, maybe, you know, fight academy boxers and boxers from Lee Stable go to Britain? I think we ought to like, do like his own kind of mini Commonwealth Games kind of situation and get some competitions going. Canada versus England, whatever, you know, as long as we're just putting good quality shows and fires on, it don't really matter, but yeah, we can't wait to get some guys over here and also get some Canadians over to UK and put them on our shows as well. When you spoke to, you know, you've been here for a couple hours speaking to people here, how, how have they reacted when you said you're, you know, you're representing Fight Zone now and here? Uh, I think uh, using using different terminologies, it's, the glass is very uh, much half full. Uh, and then Steve just touched on something there. Canada's in the Commonwealth. We've got Commonwealth matchups. We've got Commonwealth champions. And uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, Steve. My, my phone's been. I've been getting texts tonight about can we get over there? Can we put some kids on over there? And uh, me, me, Steve, and Lee has had a conversation about that about getting kids from Canada over to the UK and get it and vice versa. So I think it's it's the start of a great journey. And, uh, and, and you know, we, we, uh, Lee's got a few a few shows already booked for this year. And I'm looking forward to coming out here and, and, and seeing the sunshine instead of the snow. And, uh, Steve, um, what about other countries expanding Fight Zone 2? We're open to anything, really. You know, we, this, we want this to be a global brand and, and it's aiming there. The, the, the kind of subscriptions are coming in from all over the world. So, yeah, we want to spread it. Let's get this right, and then we'll move again and find another territory and work with another boxing promoter somewhere else. We're all, our door's open to any small old promoter that cannot get mainstream TV. We, you know, we're open, open for business. You're going to give one of you going to give us any clues what territory you're off to next? You know, we've got South Africa, what we've got Southeast Asia. Yeah, you know, but, but, but obviously we've only just been going for like seven, eight months, Steve, and you've seen how we've grown. We've got some quality kids uh, un, un, under our umbrella and, uh, you know, we've got two world champs. We've got Anna Rankin, we've got Jack Massey, and that's just the start. I reckon by the, and I'll make a statement here, I think by the end of this year we'll have two more world champions. Go on. Good, and give me an idea who you think they might be. A girl and a boy. <laughs> I think I know the girl one. I think I can go, but we you know, my... I'll keep that one in my mind, and if I'm right, I'll say I'm as right. Listen, Steve, you've been at the top of the tree in your game, and, and it's a privilege to have you working on our platform with us. You're a, you're a pleasure to work with, and you, you can tell us who you see. You, you know what talent is, and you've already spotted one or two, and they're going to be world champions on our platform. Steve, I want to ask you a question now. What, what do you think of the, tonight, this venue, the energy, the atmosphere, what do you think? I just, I just wish we had one in England like this. I mean, we can't see it now because the camera's on us, but there's two circular discs going around the sky above the ring. And above us here is a nightclub where we're going to have an after-show party. Well, you two are going to. I'm not because I'm, I'm a good boy. 
we are going to create a zone fight zone arena so that will come along it, it is in the making so watch this space on that what, is that imminent or a bit later well it, it should be up and running pretty soon uh, we've had a few setbacks but hopefully we can get cracking and and start putting shows on there pretty soon and, and then it's um first year of fight zone we're just coming up to the first anniversary how's it gone for you i'll ask you both this question you, you I see you've got varying answers Obviously, I've been, you've known me a long, long time, Stephen. I've been in the game a long time. I've been at the top of the tree with Ricky, Clinton Woods, Jamie McDonald, and and kids like that. And and and, it, and it's it's a buzz and it's a drug. What 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 doesn't leave you alone? And you never get bored of winning and uh, and plotting kids' paths who aren't necessarily Olympians. Um, to have his own platform, we're in charge of his own destiny, and it's how far we want to go. We, we're open, like Steve just said, we're open for anybody who thinks they can bring something to the party, and we've said this from day one. Everybody feeds from our table. We're not just, uh, you know, just exclusive. We're inclusive, and and let people come and bring something to the party, and let them benefit from that. And that's in any territory. Lee Baxter is going to be a, a major player for Fight Zone. And I, I think he's going to be like us signing Ronaldo. I said it uh, yesterday, and I think he is. I think he's a major player for us. He's a pleasure to work with. He's, he's, he's a little bit of a younger generation than Steve, so he brings a different drama to the, to the table. Um, but he's a great asset for any company, and I'm so pleased he's a partner of ours. Steve, first 12 months for you. How's it been? Has it been plain sailing? No. But anything that's worth having is never playing sailing, is it? You know, you've got to you've got to graft at it. And we've you know we've all had sleepless nights, worrying times, wondering what what are we doing? Are we doing the right thing? But if you look around you now, that it answers itself for you. You know, we're in Canada. Five years ago, I used to I was just a general boxing fan that used to pay my subscriptions and watch Sky Sports and every box office. And now in five five years after that. I'm involved with things like this. Wow, that's the only thing I can say. So the last 12 months have been hard, and I welcome and I look forward to the next 12 months and let's see where we can go. And it's a drug that's got you. It, it is a drug, it is a drug, and it's one that you can't shock off quite easy, to be honest with you. It's, once it gets under your skin, it's there. It's there. How, the, how did you get Steve into boxing? Because I know you know each other. Right. Did you get Steve into boxing? I know you've known him a long time. Well, it was his, his accountant, and guess what? He happens to be my accountant. So um, he'd been telling me about this Steve Crump, who uh, I think he likes boxing. Steve Crump, I went, introduce me to him. He says, you'll get on with Steve very well. Anyway, I think he kept him back away from me for about um, 12 months. And then when I eventually did meet him, we hit it off straight away. We put a show on together. He, he, he backed the show. He sponsored it through his company. And uh, and we've been friends ever since. We, apart from, look, if we, if we packed in tomorrow and said, that's it, we're friends. We've got outside interests as well, but it just so happens that we, we're good at this game. And uh, he's a very successful businessman, I'm a successful businessman, and uh, we love the sport and we're good at getting kids opportunity. We've already proved that in, in eight months. And we've done something special, we've done unique shows where we've, 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 we've managed to navigate our way around this crazy COVID situation where we put outside car park shows on when everybody was sat on their hands and give kids opportunity to earn a living and we and, and out of that has been born Fire Zone and long may it continue and, and this is just the start of some amazing amazing venues that Fire Zone is going to be operating in and on our platform and, and let's get the UK kids here fighting against Canadian kids, Mexican kids and, and vice versa. We're opening an all new frontier up for the UK kids. What I've noticed here and you, you, if you look behind you'll notice this Usually at home, when the first fight starts, the pool will be a quarter empty. This one's absolutely, you know, they're full sitting there waiting for the show, aren't they? It is. It's, 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 it's like how uh, the UK used to be. I think we've been, I think they probably starved. Uh, and that's what I'm saying. This is untapped. We're from Sheffield. We've had world champion after world champion. Canada hasn't had world champions for a long, long time. And hopefully on the back of Lee Baxter, we're going to be taking kids to the world titles. And you watch. This will be absolutely buzzing. This place won't be big enough for some of the talent that's going to come out of Canada. Can you think of a venue in England that's anything that looks like this? I really can't, to be fair. It is super special. You know, it's, it's just exciting. It's just fresh. 
Everything about it is just cutting edge. And, you know, I'll take me hat off to Lee Baxter, the Canadians. What lovely people they are. You know, everybody's made us feel so welcome. They're so laid back, nothing's a problem. And I can't wait to come back. You know what he said to me? He said, you know these Canadians, they're British with American accents. <laughs> and, and really, I think they are, to be honest, because they just like us on it and they welcome us as, as their own. It's like and it's a, they're a pleasure to work with. Okay. They're a bit more relaxed than us, trust me. You've been yeah, around here the last, okay. have you been around here the last couple of hours? Okay. I'm all right, I'm all right, but you've been here the last couple of hours. These people are so chilled, they're horizontal, it's, aren't they? It's a sea valley, he stresses us all out. Steve just gonna have to have a vodka Red Bull and I says, I'm not touching anything tonight. I'm staying calm, I'm going on water. See how my nose is great. Um, but look, we're chilled and we're just we're just loving the atmosphere here. And I, I'm looking forward to seeing the talent on the show and you'll tell me and we'll tell you who's the next big thing maybe from tonight. Will you tell me? Are you gonna tell us who's the next big thing? Who do you think's the next big thing? You had a look? I'd I'm going to sit on the fence on that and wait, and uh, and you can ask us later on, Steve, if you want. Uh, we'll just make sure we don't drink too much vodka and, uh, and and like Dennis, have his special water, and we should be all right to answer serious questions later. See you what, but I better find someone else to chat to because you've, you've you've done your shift, and I know you want to save all your energy for the after show. Thanks very much, fellas. Cheers, and now I'll try and find somebody else for us. Sponsored by Everlast and Fight Zone and featuring 10 rounds of action for the IBO International Welterweight Championship. Please now welcome your ring ladies for today, Jade and Nicole. And at this moment, let's bring in the fighters for today's first matchup. Let's welcome to the ring, Benjamin Sola Martinez. Aventarme un tiro con el negro, con el rojo y con el giro. En este corral yo mato, no se metan con lo mío. No porque sean de palenque. Van a creer que yo me espanto. One of those wins has come by way of knockout as well. The biggest of those three, of course. The win over Briscoe, which he will look to repeat here in Toronto as we kick things off on Fight Zone. Traigo la sangre caliente. No me la puedo. And now, let's bring in his opponent. Let's hear it for William Briscoe Jr.
the son of Billy Briscoe, who was in his corner, the noted trainer. Many will remember from his days with Gabe Rosado in the gyms in Philadelphia. Ladies and gentlemen, let's send it up to our ring announcer, Mr. Chris Kochi. Score this four-round contest in the Super Welterweight Division: Martin Dalida, David Dunbar, and Jeremy Hayes. Your referee in charge in the ring, Mark Simmons. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing white with the red-green trim. His official weight, 148.4 pounds. His professional record stands at three victories, including one big win by knockout and three defeats and six bouts de Puebla, Mexico. Introducing Benjamin Solar Martinez. Across the ring, his opponent fights out of the red corner. He's wearing silver trunks. He tipped the scale at 152 pounds even. His record shows one victory by knockout and one defeat. He is from Philadelphia, PA, USA, introducing William El Flaco Brisco Jr. Once again, referee Mark Simmons with the instructions. All right, boxers, we went over the instructions in the dress room. Obey my commands at all times. Touch gloves. Good luck to the both of you. So we are set to go here with our opening contest. Four rounds in the super welterweight division. Billy Briscoe Jr., Benjamin Solar Martinez, two. Kicking things off here at the Rebel Entertainment Complex in Toronto, Ontario. Corey Erdman and Steve Mulder on the call for you all night long. And Billy Briscoe immediately well, almost had Martinez trapped in his own corner in the opening five seconds of this bout. You know, coming off that loss in their last match, he wants to set the tone to let him know that, hey, I'm not here to, for the upset loss this time. I'm here to win, and he stepped right to him. Yes, let's go, Billy. Martinez returning the favor, good right hand. That might have clipped Briscoe, and Briscoe holds on. He may be in trouble here in the opening minute. Yeah, definitely, that hook definitely wobbled him a little bit. He's holding on. I think Martinez felt what Briscoe had. And he's determined that, you know what, I can drop him a second time. He did drop him in their first contest. He's definitely hurt, but he's got to move and box. He can't sit on the ropes like that because that's where he got caught early. He's sitting on the ropes like that. He's got a box from the outside. Briscoe with a uh, late shot there that Martinez is not particularly happy with. But Briscoe still seems very out of sorts. It's the awkward, wild, heavy shots coming from Martinez that are really throwing Briscoe off. This is going to get back to that jab, stay on the outside and gain his composure. He can't sit there and exchange, exchange with Martinez because that's what Martinez is good at. Good body shot there from Martinez and a left hook right along the belt line. Ooh. Good counter there from Briscoe, but Briscoe's wobbled again. He's holding on. He landed a good left hook himself, but stood there without moving his head or stepping off to the side and got caught with a right hand from Martinez. Briscoe barely remained on his feet. He had to sit down in a full squat there, Steve to try and stay up, but he managed to avoid the knockdown. A wild start to our opening contest. When he boxes like that with that jab, like I said, Martinez can't get in on him, so that's what we've got to continue to do and not sit on the ropes. Well, Briscoe not really hiding the fact that he's still recovering here. He is just holding on whenever he gets an opportunity. Not a bad idea. It's not a bad idea, but as long as he's on the outside with that chin down, popping that jab out, he's, he's, his arm length is uh, longer than that of Martinez. succession of jabs there from Briscoe a moment ago, but. It was three or four in a row, but when he sits there like that, that's when he's gonna get caught with shots from Martinez. On well, the judges, 
The judges will remember that eye-catching sweeping right hand that came after those four popping jabs, unfortunately for Frisco. Round two underway. We'll see if Billy Briscoe Jr. can find his legs here after a minute reprieve. Scary hours for Briscoe in that opening round. Rocked early in the round, was hurt numerous times. But there were flashes, Steve, as you pointed out, of Briscoe kind of finding the range where he can make this fight easy on himself. Absolutely, when he uses that long, that long jab of his and keeps Martinez on the outside, he's free to throw the right hand and free to stay from the return fire from Martinez. Another sweeping right hand there from Martinez. He just has not been able to miss with that. It connects again, but Briscoe might have rattled him there with a left hook. Can't miss with the jab. Right hand connects from Briscoe, as does a left hook, but back comes Martinez. You know, the work from Martinez, it doesn't look pretty at all times, but maybe that's what's made it confusing for Briscoe to pick it up. It's, it's not something you're used to seeing, a right hand coming from 180 degrees. Absolutely, I can tell you from experience, um, Corey, when you fight a guy who's so awkward, you don't know when he doesn't know what he's gonna do, it's impossible for you to know what he's gonna do. You hear the corner of Briscoe asking him to get around, which means scoot out to the center of the ring. They want him in the center of the ring, outbox, and keeping Martinez at the end of his jab. And that's the Billy Briscoe senior technique that he learned from legendary trainer Wesley Muzon, who handled the careers of greats like Dwight Muhammad Kawi. It's very focused on those pivots, Steve. Pivots on the inside. They work on kind of a, a clock that they like to tape on the ring canvas. And it's creating angles all right. day. Creating angles, giving you that extra six inches of room or space to land your shot or to get away from a shot. Briscoe might have found a rhythm here, Steve, where he could take control of this fight, which is to not entertain any inside fighting at all, tie him up, and simply work out here. And a beautiful left hook by Briscoe, which was set up by that beautiful left jab. And you're right, Corey, he is finding a rhythm. He's, he's starting to find his range and find a rhythm. It's becoming real difficult for Martinez as he chases him around the ring. Final 10 seconds of round two here, a good comeback round for Billy Briscoe Jr. who is in a world of trouble in the opening three minutes. Thank you. 
Round three of our opening contest. This four-rounder in the 154-pound division, Billy Briscoe Jr. taking on Benjamin Solar Martinez for a second time. That first contest was won by Martinez. He dropped Briscoe in that fight and swept the fight on the scorecards. And Briscoe complaining about a clash of heads, but... Protect yourself at all times, Corey. We know that. While he's chatting with referee Mark Simmons, Martinez is just chucking punches. I'm sure Briscoe Sr. will tell me he gets back to the ring. Don't look for the referee to help you or save you in there. Keep your hands up and fight at all times. Near the corner of Briscoe saying jab going to your right to get away from the right hand of Martinez, which when an orthodox fights an orthodox, he should be moving to his right to keep away from the right hand. Stop, stop, stop. Hey, hey, stop, stop. Well, it's an interesting adjustment to have to make, Steve, because a lot of fighters, you know, they would open up with a jab or they would start their sequence with a left hook maybe. Martinez is throwing the right hand kind of as his entry point. And it's just so wild and so unpredictable that it's tough to get a good range or gauge for it. So that's why the corner's asking him to move to his, to his right away from the right hand. Oh, and a beautiful three piece. Yeah, good left hook there from Billy Briscoe. Martinez finds a left hook and he lands along the belt line and there again, there's that right hand but Briscoe has one of his own and he comes behind it with a crisp left hook. This is the best that Billy Briscoe has looked in this fight, I think, Steve. Absolutely, he's um, he's standing the outside, he's boxed well, he's used that jab. But give credit to Martinez, he's still moving forward and still throwing his shots. Whoa. And a uh, takedown there from Briscoe and getting a little physical on the mat as well. Back to action with the final 10 seconds of this round. A good round for Billy Briscoe. I, I, you know, there were good moments for Martinez as well, but certainly improvements being made along the way for Briscoe. Briscoe controlled the round. He boxed from the outside. He used that jab. He didn't get caught up in exchange by sitting on the ropes. Welcome Very good round for Briscoe. Club. It's a lead box to promotion tonight, Bobby. Let's go. the final round of our opening contest here, and it has been a fun one. Billy Briscoe Jr. in a rematch with Benjamin Solar Martinez. And Steve, let's, let's assess where we're at in this fight. It's a clear first round goes to Martinez. Briscoe makes some adjustments in that second round, but maybe it goes, it could go either way. The third round, maybe a little clearer for Billy Briscoe. So the, the fight could very much be hanging in the balance right now. It could be winnable for either guy, depending on their performance in this in these final three minutes. Well, it's definitely a very entertaining fight to watch, but it'd be a nightmare as an official to score this fight. Like you said, Corey, some of these rounds were close and tough to go either way, but so far in the last round and a half, Briscoe has boxed from the outside, used that jab, and did what he's had to do to, to be the victor. And a good overhand right there from Martinez. Applying to a little shoe shine combination from Briscoe. 
Martinez certainly fighting with urgency here in the fourth round, and understandably so. You know, you're coming in facing the promoter's fighter on the road. You have to assume that you need a little extra. Perhaps it shouldn't be that way, but I understand why he thinks that. That's the way it is, and especially in a four-rounder when there's only 12 minutes of boxing. I mean, you gotta give it your all, especially in the last round. These rounds are closed. He knows you gotta go for broke here in the final three minutes. And for Billy Briscoe, this is as much mental as anything, just erasing those demons, that one loss that you have, just get the win one way or another. And he showed a lot of heart and a lot of will getting hurt early in this fight, and not only show he wanted to revenge that loss, but he belongs in the ring with Martinez, and he's the better man of the two. Martinez looking for his fourth victory as professional. He's three and three coming into this contest. And for fighters like Martinez, wins like this, they get you another job. You know, they get you another booking, probably on the road, maybe again in Canada, but it certainly opened some eyes to promoters who are looking for guys who can test their prospects like Briscoe. That's exactly what a promoter wants, a guy who's gonna come here, push their prospects to the limit to show what they truly have. Fighter gains nothing if you go in there and hit a guy with a jab and knock him out. It's fights like this that are going to make a fighter grow into championship quality, which you need. Good little sequence from Briscoe a moment ago. He smothered Martinez on the ropes, he let him off, and then he landed a combination once they got back to the center of the ring. Is that enough to avenge his only defeat? Well, the story of the night was when Briscoe boxed on the outside, it was very easy for him. The only time he was in trouble was when he let Martinez keep on the rope and bang him on the inside. And Briscoe, at a certain point, too, was able to adjust and start avoiding that big sweeping right hand with a little more regularity. In the first round, he couldn't miss for Martinez. Gradually, as the fight went on, those right hands started landing less and less. Briscoe found his range, used his jab, and he definitely knew the distance from that right hand. Another impressive performance for Benjamin Solar Martinez. Certainly made his case in each and every round. Who had Briscoe in trouble early. And never stopped throwing power shots for all four rounds. Definitely a good opener for the night. Looks like we are just a moments away from our official decision. Yeah, it looks like we are all set. Let's send it up to the center of the ring. our ring announcer, Mr. Christian Gauthier. Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of four rounds of action, we go to the judges' scorecards. Judge Hayes scores this contest 39-37 in favor of Briscoe Jr. Dave Dunbar scores at 39-37, Solar Martinez. And Judge Delada scores this contest 38-38. This bout is a draw. Well, you know, Steve, sometimes fighters run into opponents that have styles that they just can't quite figure out. And it's the worst case scenario for a fighter like Briscoe, who if you matched him differently, maybe he's 3-0 right now. But two of his fights have come against a guy that just somehow has his number 
and <laughs> takes him to a draw here in our opener here tonight. Like it's unfortunate, Corey, but you're right. Sometimes these guys come along where they're awkward. You can't find their rhythm. And no matter how good you are in the gym, no matter what adjustments you make, you just don't have their number. Well, we talked about what a good performance in this fight could do for Martinez. Taking the hometown fighter, not hometown fighter, but the promoter's fighter to a draw probably gets him another call from maybe another Canadian promoter, a promoter somewhere else, because they know he's going to come to fight and he might be dangerous. Or if I'm Briscoe, I'm saying bring him back again. Let's sure, get let's this do done. Sure, let's do three times. Yes. Yeah, why not? So a fun opener here on Fight Zone from Briscoe and Benjamin Solar Martinez. And we are ready for our next contest in the super welterweight division. Adrian Benbridge from right here in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. We're going to be taking on Jonathan Sanchez from Mexico City, Mexico. Moving right along to the next contest, please. Welcome to the ring, Jonathan Sanchez. Para todos los radio escuchas, estamos aquí reunidos para escuchar esta emisión. four-round super welterweight contest. Alan Davis, David Dunbar, and Jeremy Hayes. Referee in charge in the ring, Rocky Zolnerchek. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing gold trunks, official weight, 147 pounds even. 
His professional record shows two victories, including one big win by knockout, eight defeats, and one draw. Introducing from Mexico City, Mexico, Jonathan Mini John Sanchez. Across the ring, his opponent fights out of the red corner. Wears navy with white trim. He weighed in at 149.8 pounds. He has won his only professional contest so far by knockout. Introducing from Etobicoke, Ontario, Adrian, the body snatcher, Bembridge. Again, referee Rocky Zolnicek with the instructions. Went over the instructions for the change room. I expect you to obey my commands. Protect yourself at all times. Touch up. Come up back in. Right here and right here. So Adrian Bembridge fighting in his hometown of Toronto, Ontario. Round one, this one's scheduled for four. Jonathan Sanchez in the gold trunks, Bembridge in the blue, trimmed with white and black. Good overhand right there from Bembridge a moment ago. Bembridge had a, an emotional pro debut fighting on the undercard of his friend Kane Heron. Made the decision to turn pro after the pandemic all but shut down amateur boxing in Canada, decided that if he's gonna box somewhere, the only way to do it is to turn pro. He's under the guidance of my one of my former coaches, Billy Martin. They have quite the professional stable down here in Toronto, Sammy Vargas. Yeah, Billy's got a good stable of fighters growing, as you mentioned, at the Hard Knocks Boxing Club in downtown Toronto. Good left hook. A moment ago there from Jonathan Sanchez, who enters this fight with a record of two and eight, but doesn't look like a two and eight fighter already. An uppercut connects there from Sanchez a moment ago. Now Bembridge, true to his name, focusing on the body attack. He's nicknamed the Body Snatcher. And he's doing a good job in there, Corey, but after he throws those combinations, whether it be to the body and the head, he's got to step out. He's standing there, and that's something he's going to learn as he grows. And I'm sure when he gets back to the corner, Billy's going to tell him to get moving after those combinations. Well, they'll probably have a word about those left hooks that Sanchez has been connecting with. He just looked for another one. Tried to leap in with the left hook, did Sanchez, but he's connected on some good shots here in the opening round. He's scared. Good left hook from Bembridge a moment ago. Bembridge grew up idolizing Felix Tito Trinidad. One of the biggest left hookers of the game. And he said that he, as a young kid, kind of modeled his style off of that. He kind of focusing on setting up a big left hook. As he digs a left hook to the body. Bembridge read that left hook from Sanchez well. Perhaps has made an adjustment here at the end of round one. Good action from Bembridge and Sanchez. It was a very good opening round. Um, I thought earlier in the round that Bembridge had a little bit of trouble with Sanchez and couldn't find the range. But as the round progressed, I found that Bembridge used, used his jab, created a little more distance, and gave him that time to land some better shots.
round two begins. Adrian Bembridge and Jonathan Sanchez. Super welterweight action here. A catch weight, so to speak, of 150 pounds. And, and one thing to address for our international viewers is that Ontario, the province we're in here in Canada, one of the last places that still has same day weigh in, Steve, which you know all about. So you'll see kind of bizarre weights like this at 150 pounds because it's not healthy to have fighters to cut to a true 147 the day of a fight. Absolutely, it's so hard to rehydrate your body in 12 hours time and then to be able to perform at your peak performance, it's tough to expect yeah. from an athlete. So yes, that's why we do find these catch weights. Good uppercuts and left hooks landing from Jonathan Sanchez and watching his corner during the break, they were telling him to get to the inside and dig up with those uppercuts with both hands. He has obeyed those orders and had success with it here in the early going in round two. And it's been very successful, especially at the end of the first round. Brembridge is boxing from the outside, but Sanchez has made some adjustments. Now it's Brembridge's turn to make the adjustments and start boxing from the outside. When talking to Billy Martin, Brembridge's trainer, prior to the contest, you know, they feel that the size differential in this fight is going to play a factor, but right now, Sanchez is the one having the success on the inside. When Brembridge lets Sanchez get in close like that, it takes away all the, the reach and height advantage of Brembridge. Brembridge has had a lot of good work leading up to this fight, sparring with Sammy Vargas. We'll see in our main event coming up a little bit later on tonight against Premislav Ranovsky. He said that Vargas has taught him some of those veteran tricks that he's uh, learned along the way. He's a little, a uh, couple dirty tricks on the inside. He won't, won't obviously, for obvious reasons, tell us what those are. <laughs> and you can gain nothing but experience being in, in the gym and being sharing rounds with a guy like Sammy Vargas. Sammy Vargas, we know he's fought the likes of Amir Khan, Errol Spence, and the greatest guys um, in the game right now. So to gain that sort of experience at this early in his career, to do nothing but help Brembridge as he moves along. And this is good work for oh. Brembridge here over the last 15 seconds or so. As Sanchez has been leaning in on the inside, Bembridge has been able to create just enough space to land those chopping right hands to come underneath with body shots. And he looks like he might be wearing Sanchez down a little bit here. He's wearing him down, and Bembridge really found his range. He's getting real comfortable in there. But he's always got to be alert because Sanchez is throwing those wild, wicked shots. Sanchez on wobbly legs right now as the official inching closer to the action. Bembridge hunting for a stoppage, but the bell Survive. will be of assistance to Jonathan Sanchez. Round three as Adrian Bembridge had Jonathan Sanchez in a lot of trouble at the end of round two. We'll see if he could pick up where he left off. And he is indeed, he lands a big right hand that rocks Sanchez back. Sanchez still looking a little uncoordinated, a little fresher, but still not fully coordinated right now early on in round two, and that body shot rocked Sanchez back as well. We gotta give credit to Brembridge, Corey. A lot of this came from those first round body shots where he attacked the body, and he really broke Sanchez down, and that's signs to become a great fighter in the sport. 
You know, I remember that's something that me and Chris Johnson constantly worked on was kill, kill the body and the head will die. Kill the body and the head will die. And, and it shows here in the Brembridge, he's doing the same thing. Slapping right hand there from Bembridge. Takes Sanchez back to the ropes. It's a good left hook from Sanchez a moment ago just to keep Bembridge honest. But Bembridge at this point is just walking in with full confidence that he can get to the inside effectively unscathed. Absolutely. He's got him where he's won him. He's got to keep him at the end of those punches, use that jab, and wait for the opening. Right hand to the body, just digs that one in, does Bembridge. Really sunk that right hand right to the midsection of Sanchez. Sanchez still trying to battle on the inside. Unfortunately for Sanchez here, Steve, he's trying to get to the inside. He's trying to get small, but Bebridge is able to just stand up tall and land chopping shots around the side of the head and then dig to the body as well. And Sanchez can't get nothing off when Brambridge is doing that, but I'd like to see Brambridge step back because he's getting his most power at the end of his punches. Sure, he's doing damage to Sanchez when he's on the inside, but he's getting the most effect and the most power from his punch at the end of his punch from the outside, especially against a shorter man like Sanchez. He can't get all the whip from, from on the inside when he's inside like that. Sure, he's going to land shots and it's going to be effective and it's going to break Sanchez down, but he's not going to get that flashy one punch knockout that he could from the outside. More chopping shots there from Bembridge. Sanchez just trying to stay out of trouble on the inside, trying to get as small as possible as Bembridge just bullies him around throughout round three. Fourth and final round here between Adrian Bembridge and Jonathan Sanchez. And in round three, Steve, it's you know not disparaging to say that Sanchez was effectively just trying to survive on the inside because Bembridge was getting to those places and when he got to the inside, Sanchez just didn't have answers. So he tried to make himself as small as possible but was still taking punishment in the midst of that. He did. He was on the inside, and he was, he was comfortable being on the inside, taking those light shots from Brambridge. But like I said at the end of the last round, I'd like to see Brambridge step back and get the most torque and distance on those shots to maybe put Sanchez out of here before the fourth round ends. Do you think maybe, Steve, that Brambridge is trying to fight in close, trying to smother Sanchez a little bit because of those left hooks that Sanchez landed in that first round. And maybe you wanted to say, all right, I want to neutralize this entirely, but if I work in here, I'm not going to get hit with that shot ever again. Well, he still could get hit with it because he has such a long jab and a good, good distance with his shots that if he used that jab to perfection, he can keep Sanchez on the outside, where when he's on the inside, Sanchez can whip that left hook at any time, and um, Brambridge going to be right there for it if he's on the inside. Good shot from Bembridge. That one landed behind the ear. It was a left hook. It seemed to knock Sanchez off balance, who's holding on at the moment. Digs a left hook to the body, does Bembridge. 
Embridge certainly an impressive athlete. He was a high-level soccer player, a high-level rugby player as well. He's been boxing for about eight years in total. As we mentioned earlier in the fight, was having a lot of success on the Canadian amateur circuit, but simply ran out of opportunities because of what was going on in the world and decided to fulfill his dream of turning pro. Good work there from Bembridge. Left hook City. Downstairs, upstairs from Bembridge, just rocking Sanchez around the ring here in the final round. Final 10 seconds as Sanchez has been able to survive. Basically a three round onslaught from Adrian Bembridge. And that's a tough fight for Bembridge to look good in. A guy who's saying, like Sanchez, he was so tough and so awkward, it's tough to look good against a guy like that. He didn't really blow it on his shield to try to win this fight after the first round was over. A good experience for Bembridge exactly. to and be able that to he, go the distance. And I know that him and his coach, Billy Martin, are going to take this four rounds, this 12 minutes, as a great learning experience. And these are the times and rounds you need to become a complete fighter. You know, one thing I've enjoyed about learning about Adrian Bembridge is just how excited he is to just be in there as a professional. He talks about this, you know, being a dream come true, like he's living in a dream, just to be in there. And I think, you know, there are a lot of fighters that maybe take these early career fights for granted. Not everyone gets to be a professional boxer, and, and Adrian Bembridge seems to be just soaking it all in. And, you know, that, that shows in his training. I've talked to Billy before. He's one of the hardest workers in the gym alongside Sammy Vargas. So you know he has that athleticism and that will to be great and that will to be a champion. Bembridge, who is 16 and 4 in the amateurs with 10 knockouts. Barring something uh, really funky on the scorecards, he's about to improve to 2 and 0 oh as a professional. And it looks like we are all set to make this one official. Let's send it up to our ring announcer, Mr. Chris Gochia. Judges Davis, Dunbar, and Hayes all score this contest 40 to 36, all in favor of the winner by unanimous decision, Adrian the Body Snatcher, Pembridge. as he works towards his goal of fighting for a Canadian title by the end of the year. That would be a very quick progression in his professional career, but I think you know, perhaps a reasonable one you know, to be able to fight for a Canadian title, maybe by December. It could be something that Adrian Bambridge, based on what we've seen of him, might be possible for. For such a young athletic guy, there's no reason why he couldn't do that or push for that with the right promoter like he has in Lee Baxter. Billy Martin is a trainer. He has the right people around him to make that happen. All he's got to do is keep producing here inside the ring. And in just a few moments, Bambridge will be speaking with our Steve Lillis. Coming up a little bit later on, it is our main event, Samuel Vargas, Premislav Aronofsky, the vacant IBO International Welterweight title on the line. But right now, Adrian Beveridge is standing by with our Steve Lewis. Win number two, that looked like a good learning fight for a young prospect. It really was. It was a tough one. A very tough one. You leave the you, I notice you come into the ring with a big smile on your face and you leave it with a smile on the face. Is that your outlook on life? Yeah, that's how it is. I know how high they train and I know what I'm capable of, so I'm always happy. So talk us through the fight, because you early in the first round, you was hitting him with body shots. Did you think he was going to go? He 
a tough one, I gotta tell you. I hit guys with those kind of shots that they go down. But he came prepared and he's a tough guy. Hey, well, thanks very much. You got a lot of fans behind us there. You go and enjoy yourself. Thank you. Thanks for coming on the fight. Thank you. Welcome to the ring, Karen Fletcher! Yeah. Nigga, y'all done put that fire together at body head, nigga. I'm in this motherfucker now, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah! This is Darren Fletcher making his way to the ring with a record of 1, 6, and 2. He's fighting out of Brantford, Ontario, Canada. Fighting for the first time since September of 2018. Quite a layoff to be breaking here tonight in Toronto. And here comes his opponent, Nate Fantasy! scene over the last five years or so you're very familiar with Nick Fantuzzi who is basically a walking fight of the night one of the most reliable action fighters on the Canadian scene today fighting for the first time since January of 2020 and promising to bring the action once again we are all set to introduce the fighters. Let's send it up to our ring announcer, Mr. Christian Gauthier. Ladies and gentlemen, this Lee Baxter Promotions event is sponsored by Everlast and Fight Zone. Subscribe to Fight Zone now and get your first three months free of charge. Go to fightzone.uk. Introducing your three judges sitting at ringside to score this six round contest in the light heavyweight division. Martin Dalada, Alan Davis, and David Dunbar. Referee in charge in the ring, Donovan Boucher. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing red with black trim, official weight, 166.6 pound. His professional record stands at one victory, six defeats, and two draws. Introducing from Brantford, Ontario, Darren Dynamite Fletcher. Williams. Across the ring, his opponent fights out of the red corner, wears white with black trim. He tipped the scale at 170.4 pounds. He is undefeated in 10 professional contests with a perfect 10 victories, including five big wins by knockout. Introducing from Toronto, Nick Fantasy. Donovan Boucher, referee at the center of the ring with the instructions. Okay, gentlemen, let's have a good, clean fight. I gave the instructions to the change room. Listen to my comment at all time. Protect yourself at all time. Any question? Touch glove. Good luck to both of you.
As Nick Fantauzzi made his way to the ring, you heard the sounds from uh, the Rocky soundtrack, and that's how he got into boxing, was by watching the Rocky movies. And sometimes, Steve, over the years, his fights have looked like something out of a Rocky movie, trading knockdowns and eventually, ultimately, scoring knockouts himself. Fantauzzi has been a lot of fun to watch on the Canadian circuit over the last few years. His fights are definitely entertaining. He has the heart of the Italian stallion, Rocky Balboa. As we mentioned, both fighters coming off significant layoffs. Fantauzzi last fought in January of 2020, but Darren Fletcher, not since September of 2018, when he dropped a four-round decision to Jordan McHugh. Body shot there from Fantauzzi. Fantauzzi's battled some injuries throughout his career. He's had hand troubles. If I remember correctly, he had some shoulder issues as well that he's had to deal with. But over the last few years, he's got himself into tremendous physical condition. He's always been in great condition, but now is sitting fairly comfortably in a position where he thinks he can make 168 once he can fight maybe outside of Ontario where he doesn't have to weigh 171 on the day of the fight. <laughs> Quiet first round here by Fantauzzi standards. And Fletcher just walked him down, but he's not throwing any punches. He just, kept, he just keeps following um, Fantuzzi around the ring without jabbing or throwing any right hands or any sort of aggressive pressure from him whatsoever. Jab to the body there from Fletcher. Oh, and a right hand right connects there from Fletcher as well. Good right hand to the body from Fantuzzi. Right hand right down the middle from Fantuzzi a second ago. And a right hand to the body. Fletcher has never been stopped in all six of his losses. So he knows how to take care of himself in there. He's looking fairly crafty there in the opening round. Tough round to score, a feeling out process round for both fighters. With well, five rounds left, we're going to see who really wants it to start this second round. Round two underway. Nick Fantauzzi and Darren Fletcher. Fairly tentative opening round. Which frankly is, is the fight that Fletcher wants here. He wants this to be a, a kind of quiet night. He's, throughout his career, he's kind of been a, a pure spoiler type fighter. He doesn't want to get the crowd involved in this fight by going back and forth. He wants, like you said, to stand on the outside, it'd be nice and quiet, him to accumulate points as the rounds go on. But Fantuzzi's got to keep doing what he's doing here, step up on that jab with the right hand and keep stepping forward. Although well, it was uh, quite a while ago now, Fletcher does have a, a history of taking some pretty good Canadian fighters the distance. Guys like Brandon Cook, 
who of course challenged for a world title. Brandon Brewer, who we saw fight on DAZN a couple of years ago as well. He was able to take those guys rounds early in their careers. And Darren Fletcher almost uh, getting tangled up with the official. Former Canadian welterweight champion Donovan Butch Boucher, the third man in the ring tonight. Fletcher. See Fantuzzi's wobbled. He's he wobbled. wobbled. Fletcher right hand. connected on that right hand, right on the top of the head. I was just about to say, Fantuzzi can't just keep following Fletcher around the ring, and that's what he's doing. He wasn't jabbing, wasn't throwing right hands, and he walked right into the right hand that buckled his knees, and he's still a little wobbly, Corey. Well, this is nothing new for Fantuzzi, who has been dropped on more than one occasion in the past. He's been hurt. He's rallied back, and sometimes this is when he kind of wakes up. Your Oturo Gatti, Mickey Ward comes out of him. I said, we don't want to take away from Darren Fletcher, who's having a, a tremendous start for someone who has not fought since 2018. Fletcher back working the perimeter. Not taking any unnecessary chances here. At the same time, he's kind of allowed Fantasi to recover. But maybe felt that he didn't have him hurt quite enough to just go for broke. That's what I was gonna say, Corey. Did he have him wobble? Absolutely, but did he have him out on his feet? Not, not in the least. Right hand to the body there from Fletcher, which will punctuate an excellent round for the man from Brantford, Ontario. Stop, stop. begins as Darren Fletcher looking to build upon what he did in round two. He had Nick Fantauzi wobbled. It was a right hand right on top of the head. Had Fantauzi in a little bit of trouble, but Steve, as you and I discussed, kind of made the decision that he wasn't hurt enough to really change what he's been doing. And Fletcher is having success just boxing from the outside. He is, he's boxing from the outside like we spoke upon earlier. He's keeping this fight nice and quiet, not letting the crowd get into it. Boxing from the outside, landing some clean shots. Where for Ntuzzi here in round three, you know, he could be down two rounds. He's definitely down one round. The first round was close. He's got to start letting threes and fours go, especially when he has Fletch on the ropes like he does right now. You know, I was just about to say that. that one way that Fantasi can change the dynamic of this fight is to simply up his volume. Because right now, Fletcher's probably throwing more often than he is. Throwing and he's more, the best landing shot. more, absolutely. He's throwing more and landing more, or Fantuzzi's just kind of pawn that jab. He's gonna start letting go threes and fours and hope that two or three land to impress the judges ringside. It worked for Fantasi to get off the ropes with that left hook, spin back out into the center of the ring. How's he getting a little busier with his jab? He said that he wants to be the first fighter to stop Fletcher. There's 
been able to go the distance in each and every one of his pro fights. He's keeping Fletcher where he wants with that jab. He's going to start letting go with that right hand. He threw a good right hand to the body, but he's going to let it go more often in different variations. Fletcher right now looks a little less comfortable boxing while he's moving forward. There's a lot of head movement, but he's far less active when he's moving forward than when he's able to push off his back foot. And right now, Fantasi having a good little sequence. And he's starting to feel the pressure. Nick's really coming along with that jab, keeping that jab in his face and throwing a lot more right hand than it was in the previous round. Good bounce back round. Here for Fantasi, who just misses with an uppercut right at the end of the round. In the second half of that round, Nick Fantuzzi started letting go of that jab and fall off the right hand, and that made the round very close if he didn't steal it at the end of that round. Good bounce back round from Nick Fantauzzi there in round three. And he can't let Fletcher get comfortable. He's got to go right back to what it was winning in the end of the last round, pumping that jab and falling up with the right hand, just like he did right there. And what looked to be working for Fantauzzi in that last round is kind of a, a variation of the tempo. As, as I pointed out in the last round, Fletcher looked a lot more uncomfortable when he was moving forward. So Fantauzzi was able to jab and kind of back lull him, him into that and then push him back where he did have a good little sequence at the end of the round where he landed an uppercut on the inside. Connects there from Fantasi. Good sweeping left hook from Fletcher. That one could have spelled trouble if it landed just maybe one inch higher on the head. Both guys are at their best, Court, when they're throwing double jab, right hand, one, two, three. They're not the greatest at landing one pop shot like a Mayweather type guy. It's a three shot combo like that. The good left hook to the body, and the threes and fours, they're laying the combinations, getting through the guard of Fletcher. Yeah, there was a looping right hand that landed for Fantauzzi, and he looks for it again, and I think he caught Fletcher a second time with the same shot. Fantauzzi just jumps in with a left hook. And the more this fight devolves into this kind of brawl, the better it is for Nick. He'll feed off the crowd, he'll feed off the energy, and he'll start letting his hands go, and that's when he is dangerous, and he's shown that in the past. Sailing past the far shoulder. Fantuzzi has to go back to what was working for, for him earlier in the round. Three and four punch combinations. It's not the one shot that's going to get it done. It's getting close with the double jab, throwing that right hand in the right hook, and also digging into the body when he gets that range closed in. Good counter there from Derek Fletcher. 
Cardinal slapping left hook. Fantauzzi now trying to get the last word in the round, but there's a good two-punch combination from Darren Fletcher. Toronto, I need you to put your hands together because the city's back the open, Bobby! They're very tough. I mean, Fantuzzi boxed straight from the Let's outside, go. but then Fletcher will let go a wild three or four-piece combination and catch uh, Fantuzzi in the gloves. This one's scheduled for six. Light heavyweight contest between Nick Fantauzzi and Darren Fletcher. A fight that uh, on paper, understandably, a lot of people would have looked at and, and thought that this could be an easy win for Fantauzzi. You have Fletcher, who's one six and two. He's coming off a layoff since September of 2018. But this has turned into be, this has turned into, excuse me, an extremely tricky matchup for Fantauzzi, who's had to make adjustments again and again throughout this contest. Fantuzzi finding his way early here in round five, finding the home of those left hooks to the body and to the head. Some rough stuff along the ropes there. As Fletcher didn't appreciate being uh, almost pushed over the top rope. As Fantauzzi just continues to try to get Fletcher out of his rhythm. And you can see why Fletcher, despite his record, has never been down, has never been stopped. He's not an unathletic guy who comes here out of shape. He's coming here to win. He's doing the best with what he has, and he's not going to lay down. And he does throw hard, wild, looping shots. And he's also aware at this level of how to stay out of trouble. As you mentioned, he has some pretty good legs. He has good movement in there. But he doesn't stick around in the pocket long enough to get himself into too much trouble. Not only that, he keeps his hands held high. He doesn't throw wild shots where he doesn't have one hand up and one hand down. His hands are always up in a defensive position. So yeah, there's no doubt that he hasn't been stopping. He's give, given these guys, these up-and-comers, good quality fights, like he is here tonight against Nick Fantuzzi. Fantauzzi wants to be fighting for a Canadian title before the end of the year. And a fight like this, of course, assuming he can be victorious here tonight, this is a good learning experience for him as well. You know, having to face a guy that isn't just a straight ahead brawler who's going to match what he wants to do. Fletcher is doing everything Fantauzzi does not want to do. Like I said earlier, and hats off to Lee Baxter because he doesn't match his guys easy. These type of fights against fighters who push you to your limits are only going to make you grow and become a better fighter. And with only 10 pro fights, these are the fights that Nick needs to grow and become a complete fighter. fantasy has been getting some good sparring, working out with his friend Steve Rolls, who of course will be facing Edgar Berlanga. Another difficult round to score there between Fletcher and Fantauzzi. And as we head into the sixth and final round, it's, it's tough to say exactly where this is sitting on the scorecards. There's been one emphatic round that's gone to Fletcher when he hurt Fantauzzi, and the rest of them, I think there's a, there's there are things to like from both fighters in almost every round we've seen. Though they're up for grabs, Corey, I think the better boxing, the ring generalship, the nice jab from Nick Fantuzzi would give him the edge in scoring these rounds for him. But I mean, we have three different judges, and it's their opinion.
Sixth and final round. Between two Canadian light heavyweights, Nick Fantauzzi and a Darren Fletcher of Brantford, Ontario. As Fantauzzi tells Donovan Boucher to uh, watch out for the shots behind the head from Fletcher. And it's entirely possible that this is a critical round for both fighters. As Fantauzzi looks to me like he's upping the tempo a little bit here. And Fletcher takes a spill along the ropes. Brantford, Ontario, the hometown of Darren Fletcher. Of course, our international viewers might know it as uh, the birthplace of the telephone, Alexander Graham Bell, or the hometown of Wayne Gretzky, but also has some boxing legacy as well. The most famous fighter, Gary Summerhays, who fought Mike Quarry and Marvin Johnson and Michael Spinks, and our fans here in Toronto would remember his fights with Eddie Mello as well. Some good shots coming from Fantuzzi here. Going up the middle of that uppercut and caught him with a big left hook and now digging into the body. And Towsy trying to rally for a late knockout here. Here Billy Martin telling him to stay there and keep the pressure. Keep Fletcher in that corner. Put good shots on the inside there from Fletcher. Fletcher backing Fantauzzi up, who holds on along the ropes. Nothing of consequence landing there, and Fantauzzi now turns him around, and he's looking to land some uppercuts with Fletcher trapped along the ropes. Fletcher wisely got out of there and back to center ring. Oh, a good right counter shot from Fletcher. From Fletcher. The majority of this round, though, this has optically been very good for Fantauzzi, who's looked like he's been the one in charge of these final three minutes, perhaps more so than we've seen throughout this fight. The clean, harder shots have definitely landed for Fantauzzi in this round. And that'll do it, a good competitive fight. After a two and three year layoff, respectively, hats out to both these guys. Took them a little bit longer than most to get warmed up. They closed the show and put on a good fight here tonight. Yeah, a lot of credit has to go to Darren Fletcher. Again, when you saw this matchup, you see a guy coming off a layoff of that length. You know what to expect. You know, you were frankly expecting an early stoppage. And not a layoff of wins either. Exactly, right? <laughs> I mean, Darren Fletcher, I think, exceeded everyone's expectations here tonight, whether he wins this fight or not. Definitely uh, earned himself another opportunity here on the Canadian scene. Nick Fantauzzi finally breaking that layoff. A layoff of his own since January of 2020. He scored an eight round decision that night over here at Crawley on the undercard of a uh, Broadway boxing event presented by Lou DiBella. But he's used that time off again to transform his body and get himself in a position where maybe he could fight at 168, maybe for a Canadian title, a little bit later on. A lot of those plans will depend on uh, what happens on the scorecards here tonight. It wasn't the prettiest, Corey, but I thought Nick did it enough with his jab and his good technical boxing skills. But um, throwing three and four punch combinations, I thought he did enough to secure the victory here tonight. Get that answer in just a moment. Looks like the scorecards are in, and we will send it up. 
to our ring announcer, Mr. Chris Gauthier. of six rounds of action, we go to the judges' scorecards. Judge Dunbar scores this contest 59 to 55. Judges Delda and Davis both scored 58, 56. All in favor of the winner by unanimous decision, Nick Fantasy! So Nick Fantauzzi, victorious, and now moves to 11-0 as a professional and got some good rounds there from Darren Fletcher. Again, frankly, more competitive than we thought it would be and maybe more competitive than he thought it would be, but altogether a good learning experience for someone who, if he is going to go after Canadian gold, Steve, you're going to get a tougher outing than that. You're going to get guys like Fletcher who can adapt and put you in uncomfortable situations. Um, hands off to Darren Fletcher. He came in here with, with, with such a long layoff. He came in here to win tonight. But um, uh, Nick Fantuzzi battled through the early rounds of, of the awkwardness of Fletcher, got to his game plan, through him and Billy's game plan, stand the outside box nice, and secured a six-round victory. Those are good six rounds for him tonight for such a long layoff himself. And in just a moment, we're going to be hearing from uh, Nick Fantauzzi. Still coming up, our main event, Samuel Vargas, Premislav Ranovsky. Ten rounds with a vacant IBO International Welterweight title on the line. Still a number of fights still to come. But right now, we're going to hear from your winner, Nick Fantauzzi. No excuses. Uh, I did okay and I could do better. Yeah, I'm sure you have been it seemed a couple rounds to get going. You hurt him in the end of the third round. Then he just wanted to survive. Yeah, yeah. And it's hard to fight those guys that once they get hit, they, they just want to survive. They've been around the game for years. It's easy for them to move around and die not to. It's harder for me. I could do a better job and get it done next time, but you know what? I'm happy with my performance. We've got Dennis Hobson here who promotes Fight Academy and Fight Zone shows in the UK. He, he's keen to get you over to the UK, and that's something you want, isn't it? I would love that. I would love that. I'd love to come over to the UK, and uh, I'd love to come over to the UK and get a fight there. Yeah, so it'd be great. Have you got anyone in mind for Nick? We have a great fighter called Mark Jeffers, who's got the WBO uh, Continental fight. Um, that'd be a great fight for you. Whether we do it here with Lee or you come over to the, the UK, obviously we'd make you very, very welcome. And what a great fight it'd be because you're a game kid and I think it'd be like uh, who we move on quicker. Because, you know, me and Steve, we're, we're in the business and obviously with Lee, are getting kids opportunity on the international scene. Yep. And you, you've got on the makeup, you're a good looking kid. You. you come to fight. And uh, we've got a we've got a kid the same as you, Sounds Mark good. Jeffers. So like whoever whoever wins goes on the quicker. Okay, that was just to warn you. That was me at 20 percent. So <laughs> Mark, beware! <laughs> it's coming for you. Just ask you. You you loving it the, the show so far, Steve? Well, I think we've just started the Commonwealth Games off again now, haven't we? You know, so let the games begin. Fantastic show. Set me off again to Lee Bikestage, putting a, a fantastic show on. You know, the crowd is phenomenal. The fights have been 50-50 fights. We've had some good fights. Long may it continue. Thanks a lot, Steve. Thanks a lot, Dennis. And most of all, thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching, guys. Back to MC. Hello, watching fans. Let's move on to fight number four. And welcome to the ring, Lamberto Masia. Arriba Guasega! Uno sin alor, compadre, uno! There's 
suena volato vengo dicen que nací en el roble me dicen que soy arriero porque le tiemblo y se para si les aviento el sombrero ya verán como repara ay 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 his opponent, Brian Acosta. promotions. The Canadian crowd will get its first look at him here tonight in Toronto. This contest consists of eight rounds of action in the super featherweight division. Your three judges scoring this contest at ringside, Martin Dallada, Alan Davis, and Jeremy Hayes. The referee in charge in the ring, Mark Simmons. Introducing first, Fighting out of the blue corner, wearing black with red trim, official weight, 124 pounds. His professional record consists of 16 victories, including 12 big wins by knockout, four defeats, and one draw. De Sinaloa, Mexico, introducing Lamberto El Macia. Across the ring, his opponent fights out of the red corner. Wears silver with black trim, he tipped the scale at 126.2 pounds. His record stands undefeated at 15 victories. A perfect 15 victories, including five big wins by knockout. The Hermosillo Mexico introducing Brian Latino Acosta. Again, referee Mark Simmons with the instructions. We went over the instructions in the dress room. I want a good, clean fight. Obey my commands at all times. Touch gloves. Good luck to the both of you. So Latino Heat, Brian Acosta making his Canadian debut here after signing with Lee Baxter Promotions earlier in 2020. Tonight taking on Lamberto Macias. You see Acosta in the silver trunks with the tassels. Macias in the gray trunks trimmed with red. Macias, as we mentioned during his ring walk, has spent the bulk of his career at 115 pounds or thereabout tonight. This fight being contested at 128. And as we talked about earlier on, Steve, here in Ontario, we still have same day weigh ins. So that is 128 as of this morning. And 10 pounds in those lighter weight classes is a lot of weight. I mean, that's, that's 10, 15% of your body weight. That's a lot of weight. And understandably, you see Acosta looking for a body shot here in the early going. You see the, the frame 
of Macias. Frankly, he looks like a 115 pounder. He's a lot thinner than is Brian Acosta. Left hook there from Acosta. Acosta, a member of the same camp as former world champion Miguel Burchelt and one of the top pound for pound fighters in the world, Juan Francisco Estrada. They share the same trainer, they all spar together. And as far as technical ability goes, really you you couldn't ask for a better mentor than Juan Francisco Estrada. And it's showing early here with the cost. You can tell just by the way he's moving forward, popping that jab, remaining calm. He sees all the shots coming. Um, you can tell he's within a good, he has a good camp behind him back home in Mexico. Just missing with a big right hand was Acosta. Just coming off an impressive victory over Diego Chavez in April of 2021, a wide unanimous decision win. And he's had some good exposure recently as well. He fought on the undercard of the uh, exhibition bout between Julio Cesar Chavez and Jorge Arce, which uh, for my money, when it comes to the, uh, the old timers fights, was uh, the <laughs> most exciting of any of these exhibitions that we've seen. They couldn't pick two hungrier guys to go in for an old timer match. That's right. Jorge Arce and Chavez. Macias tries to fire to the body. Acosta digs a right uppercut right along the belt line. Final 10 seconds as Acosta. Let's go a one final left hook. A good start for the new assignee of Lee Baxter Promotions. For me, that was the first time I've seen him fight. Very impressive fight, an impressive opening round of an eight round fight. He, he paced him, he, he got the range, he popped that jab, he worked on a few things. Um, it was a very good opening round for Acosta. Two underway. This one's scheduled for eight rounds. The Canadian debut of Brian Acosta. Good left hooks from Acosta. One was a counter and one he opened up with a beautiful left hook. Acosta's shown a good offensive arsenal here in the early going. Now switching southpaw. And you can see the confidence of a fighter when they come out firing uppercuts from long range. Acosta, very sure of what he's doing there in the ring and seemingly very sure that ultimately he's going to get to Macias. Macias fighting for the second time outside of Mexico. Back to Orthodox goes Acosta. We've seen Macias give prospects trouble in the past. Two fights ago, he took on a French prospect, Little T, Krista Sabe. He took him the distance. Sabe is a prospect with a lot of hype in France. And at least according to one judge, Macias made it a competitive fight. One judge had it 96-94. The other two had it 190 and 100, excuse me, 99 to 91 respectively. So for the sake of optimism, we'll focus on the most generous card. But he has been able to take guys like Asabe, was at featherweight. He's been able to take them rounds. Good shot there from Macias. 
plants his feet and lets a good combination go. A right hand in particular connects high in the head of Acosta. Good body shot there from Acosta, then switches stances and rips a right uppercut. Again, we've seen some flashes of really pretty offense from Acosta so far. A good body shot comes upstairs with a right hand. But Macias willing to stand and trade with him on the inside. And as I sit here and trade right in front of us, Corey, it's hard not to see how calm and how cool and collective and the experience that Brian Acosta has from being in such those good camps. He's calm in there. He's not panicking. He's picking his shots. He's seeing what um, Masai has to throw at him and taking his time in there. Very impressive stuff from Brian Acosta here in the first two rounds. Final 10 seconds. Another right hand connects from Acosta. As Macias forced to stand and bang with a much bigger man and there in the second round. Three begins. Brian Acosta and Lamberto Macias in super featherweight action. Still to come, our main event between Samuel Vargas and Premislav Ranovsky. Vargas making his first appearance since that loss to Connor Ben. Looking to shake that off and get back in the mix at 147. But right now, we're getting a look at his newest stablemate. Brian Acosta, who promoter Lee Baxter believes may be the, the fighter in his camp right now that could be closest to a potential world title shot. And of course, he feels that that may be within about two years or so with Brian Acosta conservatively. But there's a lot of interesting and makeable fights at the top of that division for Acosta should he continue winning over the next 18 months or so. Class heads. And Acosta rubbing his eye. We'll see if any swelling develops as a result of that. It does not appear that either fighter has been cut. And we'll get back to action. Costa has been focusing on body work for a good portion of this fight. And we have seen Macias hurt to the body, drop to the body in the past against Angel Ramos. He was hurt to the body and ultimately flurried to the canvas. There's a right hand that lands over the top from Acosta. Kind of had Macias thinking about the body work, then came up top, and that was a terrific combination. Two From beautiful Acosta. body shots. Fast, hard, and accurate. Those are nice. What really impressed me, Corey, though, is just how calm this kid is. You know what I mean? He's not letting the pressure of this being his first fight here in, in Canada under Lee Bax and promotions. He's not trying to rush him, just taking his time in there, slowly just walking his man down with a jab, fighting like a real pro in there. Picking his shots. Costa's also seemed 
pretty comfortable both as a southpaw and in orthodox. He kind of has a, a different approach as a southpaw, kind of prodding with that jab. Landing some straight lefts to the body, but it's not like Macias is having any success when oh. he turns southpaw. And in fact, there's a straight left hand that connects from Acosta. And another. Final 10 seconds of another impressive round from Acosta, who looks like he might have Macias in a little bit of trouble. But Macias rebailed out by the bell as he eats one final right hand that uh, might have been a second late. Acosta looked like he might have had Lamberto Macias in a little bit of trouble at the end of that last round. It just happened to take place in the final six seconds or so. We'll see if Acosta can pick up where he left off there. Good work on the inside. Well, Macias was maybe complaining about a low blow. Referee Mark Simmons did not think so. And Acosta wisely just kept on working. Costa really starting to pick up the tempo here. Costa making Macias work a, a lot more than maybe he's comfortable doing. And Macias throughout his career is been a jabber and mover. He likes to work around the perimeter. And Acosta has just not let him work at long range at all. And beautiful inside shots from Acosta, upstairs and down. Combination there from Acosta, punctuated with a right hand. Acosta has definitely stepped it up in this round of gear or two. He's definitely applying a lot more pressure, but he's got to keep working behind that jab. He can't just walk forward, he's got to walk forward with punches. Oh, big oh, right big hand right connects hand. there from Acosta. And Macias now trying to fire back. Now credit to Macias, he didn't try and hold on there. He tried to get out of danger by fighting out of it. It's the Mexican way, Corey. And in retrospect, he took that right hand pretty well. He's not visibly bothered by it right now. Final 10 seconds of another dominant round for Brian Acosta.
as we begin round five, considering how good Brian Acosta has looked, it's important to point out that, frankly, he's lucky to be here at all. After his win over Jesus Francisco Ortega in 2020, Acosta experienced a horrifying incident. Three men broke into his house, tied him up, beat him, and stabbed him with an ice pick. They stole his regional WBC title belt, his television, his stove, his air conditioner, and left him naked and unconscious in his house. Frankly, he was lucky to survive that, and to be looking the way he is right now, it is an absolutely remarkable story. Holy smokes, I didn't know that, Corey. Costa now on the hunt once again. Costa looked like he clipped Macias with a left hook there. Macias' corner hasn't been particularly fond of some of the work that Acosta's been able to get away with on the inside, but Acosta's working within the confines of what Mark Simmons is allowing, and he's letting them fight it out on the inside. And I think the reason I don't like it is because he's landing good, clean, hard shots. Right. And their corner doesn't like that. from Acosta, then climbs the ladder with a left hook. Good inside work from Acosta. Acosta enjoying some increased exposure here on an international platform, and he said that's one of the reasons why he opted to sign with Lee Backstreet. Kind of felt, understandably so, like he was kind of ignored or lost in the mix in Mexico where there's so much talent but maybe not the same level of visibility outside of the country as perhaps he's enjoying right now. It's definitely a good move especially with a guy like Lee Baxter who can push and expose a young guy like this with such great talents. Look at that great footwork and head movement from uh, Brian Acosta. Well and also in this stable Steve he gets to be a focal point. In Mexico there are a lot of super featherweights that are really good and you can get kind of lost, lost in the, the mix. mix. Absolutely, exactly. Corey, you can. And here he's going to be a standout. Lee's going to promote him, move him well. And with performers like this, it's going to be easy up here in Canada. six of the Canadian debut of uh, Brian Acosta and now I think that one might have been a little bit low he reached with a big left hook might have caught him on the belt line yeah, I was about to say uh, Macias in his corner they've been uh, unhappy with some of the shots that have landed by Acosta this is the first one that has been formally acknowledged by referee Mark Simmons as he lets Costa know to keep him up. Nonetheless, you'd, you'd hope that that won't deter Acosta from continuing to go to the body. His third shot was a right hook to the body, so it's not going to deter him whatsoever. And to your point, he goes right back down there, especially on the inside. Again, Macias has been hurt and dropped 
by body shots in the past. Oh, and a big left hook from Acosta. And a big right hand. He's got to get that Macias. distance. I do not know how Macias walked through those two shots. They're beautiful shots. And this is where Acosta's got to keep that range, keep him on the end of the jab, and land those big shots from the outside. You can't get tied up in the middle with Macias. Zia said that no one could take away my desire to win the fight. And indeed, we've seen him in fights in the past where he's obviously been down on the scorecards. Even in a fight where he was stopped against Gustavo Vega, he was throwing hard shots right to the final bell. And right now, despite eating two colossal shots along the ropes there from Brian Acosta, Macias is still swinging away. And again, an impressive display of toughness for Macias, a career 115 pounder, to be standing up to these shots from Acosta. As I said earlier, 10 pounds in the, in the lighter weight classes, that means so, so much. 10 pounds means so, so much. That's the reason why they're separated by three pounds, four pounds respectively in the lighter weight class, because the weight means so much when you're gonna weigh 115 pounds in total. Yeah, the percentage of the body weight. It's 10, 15 uh, exactly. percent, right? When you think about it the other way, if you were 126, cutting to 115, not a, not a happy time no. doing that. Good work there from Acosta, who is just lighting Macias up on the inside. And Macias there basically had his hands at his side taking these shots. Costa taking his time there, pumping that jab. I gotta be honest, Corey, it says a lot about a young guy like Brian Acosta to get a guy hurt like that and not rush in and swing wild and go crazy and empty his tank. He took his time. Look at that beautiful defense and shoulder roll. And again, this is classy stuff from Brian Acosta. begins. Brian Acosta putting on a show so far here against a double tough Lamberto Macias who has spent the bulk of his career at 115 pounds and has eaten some colossal shots from Brian Acosta including a right hand and a left hook that uh, would have put a lot of other fighters out Steve in the previous round. And Acosta coming out here in round seven applying a lot of pressure walking Macias down. And again, Corey, Acosta showing the maturity of being with the um, experienced camps down in Mexico, showing the maturity, not just going there swinging wild, just slowly walking Macias down, breaking him down, body and head, not swinging wild, trying to get him out there with one shot. On in, in modern boxing, if you had to pick you know, two fighters who are the perfect blend of pretty technique and also aggression, you'd pick Chocolatito and you'd pick Juan Francisco Estrada, who he's in the gym with each and every day. So you could see how some of that would ultimately rub off on him. And Chocolatito becoming a world champion again past weekend. I mean, Chocolatito's performance against Ray Martinez, yeah, I mean, that, 
you know, one of the most dominant offensive performances that I've seen in recent years. Just such a classy operator. Outside of his gym mates, Acosta says that his main fighting influences are Floyd Mayweather Jr. and Miguel Cotto. Kind of very different styles, uh, of course, Mayweather and Cotto, but you like to hear young fighters who you know, watch a variety of different fighters. Oftentimes you'll see a young fighter and you'll say, oh, I know whose tapes you've been watching. You know, straight Manny Pacquiao, if, straight Floyd Mayweather. Or Roy Jones. Yeah, you'll see a lot of clones, very obvious clones of a fighter. But it does say a lot when you're right, when they do pick three or four guys and they, and they can take the best of each one of those guys. Create their own identity. Create their own identity, correct. Final 10 seconds of a quieter seventh round between Brian Acosta and Lamberto Macias as Acosta lands one final right hand right at the bell. Costa's Canadian debut here on Fight Zone. Corey Erdman and Steve Molitor on the call for you here today at the Rebel Entertainment Complex in Toronto. Just a fantastic venue for fights. Uh, very much reminiscent with the balcony up above of the small halls in the United Kingdom. And big left hook connects there from Brian Acosta who is looking to close this one out. Oh, big and left hook connects big again. Left hook. And Macias somehow stands up to that. Acosta really going for it here in the final three minutes. Looking to make a statement in his first fight here up north. Being very smart and very patient, I'm not getting wild and going crazy, taking unnecessary risks. Because Messiah's throwing back here. Good. Another work. massive left hook there. And good defense after. Getting away out of those shots. Look at those shoulder rolls. Oh. Costa just toying with Macias along the ropes here. Impressive stuff. He's basically putting on an exhibition just with his defense that spins him around and connects on a right hand with Macias' back turn. These are the qualities you need to see in a young kid to become a future world champion. This sort of ring generalship, the smarts, the whereabouts of his defense, these are the things you see in a young champion. Well, Acosta's very upfront. He says that his main virtue is his defense. Oh, massive right hand connects again. As Acosta just teeing off on Macias. And I do not know how Macias, I keep saying this, is standing up to these shots. Hats off to Macias for taking those Big, big shots, and another, another right hand. Lands. You gotta start wondering if it's the, the corner that she may be stopping this fight, Corey. Uh, referee Mark Simmons probably having a look here. 
This is getting brutal. Stop. Macias eats another left hand. It is only being held up by Acosta's momentum. Final 10, ten seconds. seconds. An absolutely heroic effort from Macias to hear the final bell. Hats off to Brian Acosta. An offensive onslaught in the eighth round. Had Macias out on his feet, I think the fight could have been stopped at any time, Corey. I mean, credit to Macias, again, for making it to the final bell, but certainly there were times when that one could have been stopped. At the same time, his legs were still moving. He still found his way around the perimeter, but boy, oh boy, did he eat some shots. About three whole minutes there, Steve. It felt like we were one punch away from this fight ending. And yeah, we gotta give credit to uh, Brian Acosta. He fought a great fight. For me, seeing his first time fight live, very impressive. Ring generalship, skill, speed, power, great defense. This kid's a total package and is a, a good sign by Lee Baxter. Yeah, I think that boxing purists would watch that fight and there'd be a lot that they would like, especially that defensive display along the ropes that concluded with him spinning Macias around and landing a right uppercut with Macias' back turn. There's a lot to like from Brian Acosta, and even though he didn't get the knockout here tonight. We got to see a full set of skills right. from top to bottom. And if, if you're going to move forward and maybe try and put Acosta at the top of a bill here in Canada, I think he did enough to impress the viewers in attendance here live at Rebel here in Toronto. We are ready to make this one official. Let's send it up to Mr. Krista Gochia. Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of eight rounds of action, we go to the judges' scorecards. Judge Davis scores this contest 80 to 72. Judges Dalada and Hayes both score it 79 73. All in favor of the winner by unanimous decision, Brian. Latino Acosta! So a dominant, unanimous decision win for Brian Acosta in his Canadian debut in his new fighting home of uh, Toronto, Ontario, where I'm sure we're going to see plenty more of him as he embarks upon what Lee Baxter says is a 18-month plan to get him in position for a world title. And when you look at the names at the top of his division, guys like Mauricio Lara and Emmanuel Navarrete and Leo Santa Cruz, if Brian Acosta can keep going, there are some potential big fights for him against his countrymen down the road. Big fights and winnable fights. I mean, a guy like Leo Santa Cruz has been around for so, so long. In a couple years, he could be nearing the end of his career. That'd be a good opportunity for a guy like Brian Acosta to take the reins from a guy like Leo Santa Cruz. The score is 80 to 72, 79 to 73. Maybe a, you know, a little bit of a charity round you give to Macias in there. Maybe the first round, maybe. But it, for all intents and purposes, a clean sweep for uh, Brian Acosta in that fight. We're going to be hearing from him in uh, just a few moments. See Acosta in the ring with his trainer and with Lee Baxter right now.
still three fights to come here on Fight Zone tonight, concluding with our main event, Samuel Vargas and Premislav Aronofsky. Coming up next, it'll be light heavyweight action. Another new signee of Lee Baxter, Pierre Hubert de Bombe, will be taking on a Sladan Jean Janine. The veteran who we've seen on some big cars in the past brought in to test de Bombe in his Canadian debut here tonight. And our co feature still to come the Canadian women's super bantamweight title on the line, Amanda Galley and Tanya Walters. We'll go at it as Amanda Galley uh, looking to formally win this title. The first time she fought for it, didn't quite make 122 pounds, so wasn't able to walk away with the title that night when she defeated Shelly Barnett, looking to do so here tonight. But looks like we are ready. Our Steve Lillis is standing by with Brian Acosta. Thank you for joining us. Everyone loved that love thing. Yeah. I'm happy that all the people love my, my shape, my, my performance, and I'm happy to be here in Toronto, and I'm, 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 I'm here to stay here. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad that all the UK fans saw my boxing, my boxing skill, and I hope they, they, they like my style. And, uh, did you think you were going to get the stoppage there in the final seconds, Brian? Yeah, I think it, it should be stopped, but the referee could continue it, but it's no bother for me, it's no, no problem. I could, I could fight 12 rounds like that. Wow. But, but you know, was you impressed yourself with what you did tonight? Uh, the, the really is because I have almost a year inactive, so this was a fight to get an arraignment and all that. And, but I feel great, I feel good, I feel, I feel I'm in, 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 in my shape and ready for the next thing, for the next level. And was it good to fight a box on Fight Zone? Yeah, it's a, it's a great, a great, a great screen, a great for, for all the audience in, in UK. And I'm glad to be here in Fight Zone. And I, I will, I will, I will like to be other all the time in, in, in Fight Zone. I will be glad to be here. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. To you. Thank you for you. And I, uh, this, this is Latino Costa. And don't forget my my name. To the ring, snatch on Yan Yanin.
Jan Janin. Zeleno džigra ko na moni, pola dva mi kaže vremena novoj detoni. Mama kaže bolje ga se kloni, uzme ko ručoni pa se probude demoni. Ona mi razume kad sam bizi, svaka lajna tako lako krizi. Iskrivi me ko toranju bizi, am bi 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 dođi opet sam u krizi. Puna pare teška bina, izdepilirana nektarina. Cijele noći tu kod mene bila, držala me budu, ne treba mnogo vejna. Puna pare teška bina, izdepilirana nektarina. Cijele noći tu kod mene bila, zlatka mi hoteja pa ja zovem gasolina. Lej, lej, lokalo, sino celo kalo. Prljave mi felme, kilometr tuko Odam od to bene, prsto se navuko Sve mi bivše žene, kažu da sam puko Kad bi znali mile koliko sam muko Puna pare teška bina We now see the entrance of Sladan Janjanin Entering with a record of 31 and 9 24 knockouts We last saw him scoring a fourth round TKO Over journeyman Slavisa Miodrag In Croatia last December Pierre de Bombe! signings of Lee Baxter 20 0 and 1 the former European Union light heavyweight champion fights out of Nantes France now looking to make a name for himself here in Canada he is set for action let's send it up to our ring announcer Mr. Christian Gauthier light heavyweight contest Martin Dalada David Dunbar and Jeremy Hayes. Your referee in charge in the ring, Rocky Zolnerchek. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing white with the black trim, official weight, 173.2 pounds. His record stands at an impressive 31 victories, including 24 big wins by knockout, and nine defeats, introducing from Priador, Bastia and Herzegovina, Snajan, the meaner, Jan Janin. Across the ring, his opponent fights out of the red corner, wears gold with red trim. He tipped the scale at 172.4 pounds. He has gone undefeated in 21 professional bouts with 20 victories, including 10 big wins by knockout, no defeat, one draw. Introducing from Nantes in France, De Nantes en France, Pierre de Bombay. Again, referee Rocky Zolnerchik with the instructions. Okay, guys, we went over the instructions in the change room. I expect you to obey my commands. Protect yourself at all times. Touch up. Over here is good. Over here is good. Touch up. Come on, banging. So Pierre de Bombay has left the European scene behind. The former European Union light heavyweight titleist. 
Says, I have no more time to lose. And tonight he'll take on Sladan Janjanin, who has certainly uh, been around the block two fights ago. Janjanin was stopped by the popular middleweight prospect Nathan Heaney, who's one of the more popular figures on the domestic UK scene. John Janine has fought in 12 different countries in his professional career. And Dibambe has become somewhat of an international fighter himself, of course, now making his fighting home in Canada. He's also moved his training camp from France to Lanzarote in the Canary Islands, where he's been sparring with Dusty Hernandez Harrison, and now training with Jonathan O'Brien in conjunction with his trainer, Francis Perot, back home in France. And although Dubombe has won gold on the European scene at light heavyweight, he thinks of himself as more of a, a 168, more of a, a super middleweight. And like we talked about with Brian Acosta, Steve, Dubombe felt that although he had offers from other promoters that going with Lee Baxter and kind of getting the chance to be one of the stars of the stable was better for him and kind of avoided the possibility of him just kind of getting lost in the mix with another promoter. That's one of the great things about fighting up in here in Canada. The pool is not as deep. And when you get a guy like Lee Baxter who's so dedicated to his fighters, he's going to make sure every one of his, of his fighters feels like the top guy in the camp. So good thing for uh, uh, Pierre de Bombay. So far, John Johnny's been using this whole ring, but it's going to be right here where the bomb might get some froze in the ropes, which is going to cause some problems being stuck on those ropes. John Janine offers a right hand there, not a whole lot on it. John Janine has been able to stop fighters on the lower levels, as we mentioned. Last time out, a fourth round TKO over Slavisa Miodrag in Croatia. And he's also gone the distance with some quality fighters in the past as well. He went the distance with multi-time world title challenger Martin Murray in 2019. He dropped an eight round decision to Murray. And a relatively quiet opening round here from Dibambe and Jean Janin, but certainly a clear one on the scorecards for the man from France. Round two begins. Pierre Dibambe and Sladan Janjanin. Light heavyweight action still to come. Our co-feature, which will be up next, Amanda Galley and Tanya Walters for the women's Canadian Super Bantamweight title. Dibambe has been a fighter his entire life, prior to transitioning to boxing, Dibambe was actually the national champion of Taekwondo in France. He made the switch over to amateur boxing where he was 53 and 10 prior to turning pro in 2014. Good shot to the body there, a right hand from Dibambe, and he follows it up with another one, an uppercut 
right up the middle as Debombe is starting to up the tempo here. Like I said earlier, when Janjani sits on the ropes like that, he's a sitting target for Debombe. Debombe is going to unload on him. He's got to keep both feet moving, or it's going to be a, a short night for him to sit on those ropes. You might have seen in the corner Debombe kind of looking at his left arm. We've heard whispers that Debombe may be having an issue with his left elbow, which may also be why he's so right hand happy right now, but it doesn't matter. One handed, he's having a lot of success. He has to see him throw three right uppercuts in a row there with no left hook whatsoever. And we did see him touching it and showing his corner in between rounds that he had some sort of problem possibly with it. See him palm with his left hand there. He's offering his left hand enough to maybe trick John Janine into thinking it might be coming for real, but he's doing enough to, to disguise that right, that right hand. hand, exactly. Another right uppercut connects from Debombe. Right hand in the body, right uppercut. That combination, Steve, made uh, Mike Tyson a lot of money throughout his career. I'm not sure if John Johnny's aware of the, the left injury to uh, possibly to Debombe, but if he is aware of it, all he has to do to make his night a whole lot easier is circle to his right towards the left hand. That's going to take away a lot of the abuse he's been taking so far early on in these rounds. And you wonder if John Janine will start to make that kind of adjustment because all he's seen so far has been right hands. Will he be able to pick up on that and do something about it? And credit to Pierre Debombe for, you know, if he does have a short left hand, he's making do with the left hand. He are starting with the right hand. He's setting up with the left hand nice. Pierre de Bombay to this point has only needed his right hand to get Sladan Janjanin in a little bit of trouble. And if you're watching the instructions in de Bombay's corner, all of it was about the right hand. And so far, that's all he's working with here in the third. Step back right uppercut there from Debombe. And John Janine starting to cover up. And good work by Debombe. He's still posting that left hand out there, flicking that jab out there, making John Johnny aware that it still could be coming and making him walk into the right hand at Debombe's throwing with power. You mentioned that Debombe's been able to move to the Canary Islands where he's been training with a lot of good fighters over there. John Janine. Well, he doesn't have that luxury. He still works as a full-time miner. And he's admitted that at times it's, be, it's been difficult for him to find time to train, even when he has a fight on the schedule. He just has struggled at times with that work-work balance, so to speak. Well, at this stage of the game, Corey, you've been around the game long enough, you know it's not all glitz and glamour like, they, like it seems like with the Mayweather and the Pacquiao's. A lot of guys do have to maintain a full-time job until they get to that world title level and get that world title money. Good uppercut there from the Bombay, who's just firing away with right hands. Still pawing with that left hand. Nice. He's going to unleash that right hand. There he goes. 
chopping right oh. hands. John Janine trying to get away, but there is nowhere to go. The Bobby, another right uppercut. And to Bombay. John Johnny with his mouthpiece spit out there. A veteran maneuver there from John Janine. And a little confusion as to where we can maybe rinse this off. Buying John Janine the time he possibly needs to get out of escape from those right hand on, uh, onslaught that he was taking. Again, John Janine's a, a veteran who's taken guys like Martin Murray rounds in the past, and DeBombe with one arm, with one hand, is absolutely dominating him right now. Controlling him with that left hand, landing that right hand at will, and keeping him on the ropes. It's definitely been a good one-handed performance by Pierre DeBombe, that's for sure. I hate to see what he can do with two hands. Just pounding away on John Janine, who really hasn't offered anything offensively maybe in the last two minutes. Pierre de Bombay right back on top of Sladan Janjanin. You just can't find anywhere in this ring where right hands are not raining down upon him. He's not making it any easier by, on himself quite by sitting in that corner or laying on the ropes. Let's get away from that right hand. He's going to stay right there and move on the outside. But he gets on those ropes and he just sits there. Well, and, and you can see right there, just in that sequence, Steve, how the lack of left hand is hindering to Bombay just a little bit because he pivoted out. He looked at a left hook that he would have thrown but he otherwise, couldn't throw it. but he just did not throw it. <laughs> Bombay managed by former cruiserweight champion Tony Bellew. And for talking about famous friends, Ladon John Janine, a close friend of Badu Jack. Former WBC champion of the world. John Janine actually fought on Jack's undercard here in Canada when Jack fought Adonis Stevenson. John Janine's fought twice here in Canada. Uh, this may be uh, the least enjoyable night he's spent in this country so far, as he is just getting belted around the ring. And even though Pierre Dombey beyond is only allowed to use one hand, or not only only using one hand, sorry, he's using great angles, great footwork, and using the, the best, the ring, the best of the, to the ability that he can. Look at those angles he's using, because he can only use the right hand. Hard shot to the body, follows it up with an uppercut, and John Janine is staggering around the perimeter right now. Referee Rocky's owner, Chuck, taking a very close look, Corey. Hard shot to the body again. John Janine just trying to stay up. He is wearing this punishment on his face right now. The body language, the facial expressions, not positive from John Janine at the moment. Beautiful right uppercut to the body. 
That's what's really breaking down John Janine and keeping him stuck in those corners, those hard body shots. appropriate to stop this fight. I, I don't think that John Janine's shown the ability to trouble DeBombe at all. And thank goodness DeBombe only has one hand. If, if he had two hands, this fight would have been over a long, long well, time ago. But like you said, Corey, any time now is a good time. Um, John Janine has no chance of throwing that out every shot to catch DeBombe and put him out. All he's doing is taking accumulated punishment and they're right hands after right hand after right hand. It's purely power shots. It's yes. all the Bombay's best shots, and they're landing again and again. If referee uh, Rocky Zolnercheck is taking a close look at John Janine here, you saw the, the doctors on the ring apron looking a little more intently than they were prior to this. And frankly, the only reason you might believe that John Janine can make it to the final bell in this fight is because the Baba only has one hand and maybe Jean Janine can make some adjustment to just as you mentioned just circle the other way but he hasn't shown the ability to get out of the way quite yet. The power and the threat of the Bombay's power is so threatening to Jean Janine that he just freezes in the corner when realistically if he knew or was aware of the injury to, to Bombay he could just keep moving and moving away or to his right away from the left hand of the Bombay. Oh. Massive right hand flush on the chin from Pierre de Bombe. And John Janine's corner getting a, a close look at the punishment their fighter is taking. Another brutal right hand to the body. And these are loud shots, Steve, sitting here Powerful at ringside. Shots. I gotta give a lot, and again, credit to DeBombe for such a big, strong, muscular guy who's only been able to throw right hands basically from the opening round. He doesn't look tired, his legs don't look slow, he's not breathing heavy, he looks very fresh in there. And that says a lot considering he's had to just load up with one hand the whole night. What a kind of, it, it sounds silly to think of an actual fight as practice in any way, but in some ways it is for DeBombe, who's fighting with right hand and having to use angles that otherwise he wouldn't, and landing right hands that are just battering John Janine around the ring and finally put him down to the canvas. John Janine not on steady legs at the moment. Some wobbly steps there towards Rocky Zonercheck. He will let this go. And more right uppercuts on the way. And the, towel. Oh, and the ref towel comes in. The referee does not see it. He does now. It was on the corner of the ring there. Got caught up in the ropes. And John Janine will dispute it, but now he'll have to take it up with his corner. Whether the referee, the corner, it was a good stoppage all around. Yeah, it was a stoppage that absolutely had to happen. It looked awkward in practice because of how it happened. The, the towel getting stuck on the, on the top row. The referee not quite spotting it. And then the stoppage happens as they're kind of exchanging, but 
that fight had to end there and probably could have ended a lot sooner. And regardless of the performance tonight, I know that I'm really looking forward to see Pierre de Bombay come back and fight here again or in Canada with two arms because with one arm he was very impressive against a, a tough Janjani, but I like to see de Bombay with two arms fight in action. Yeah, a healthy Pierre de Bombay is going to be an interesting name to watch at 168 where he currently sits kind of on the fringes of the IBF rankings. He says that with, again, within 18 months, his 18-month plan is to ultimately work his way up those rankings and challenge for an IBF title. He puts on an impressive performance here in his first fight in Canada, his first fight under the Lee Baxter Promotions banner. Looks like we are about ready to make that one official. Oh, let's send it up to our ring announcer, Christian Gauthier. Referee Rocky Zoner take halts this contest at two minutes and 47 seconds of round number five. The winner by TKO and still undefeated, D.A. some physical limitations in this fight, very obviously. We had heard whispers of a left elbow injury heading into this fight, but he only needed one hand to absolutely batter a tough veteran in Sladan Janjanin. And again, Janjanin is a guy who had gone rounds with good fighters in the past, but Dabambe with one hand only was absolutely able to just overwhelm him from bell to bell. It says a lot about the power in the right hand of Pierre de Bombay. And in just a few moments, we will hear from uh, Pierre de Bombay. Bombay poses for some photos with his team, including his new trainer, Jonathan O'Brien. As we mentioned, he moved his training camp to the Canary Islands. He said he tried training in the United Kingdom, but the rent was too high there. So he, had, he was cutting into his paycheck a little bit too much. He had to move it to uh, the nice, pretty location in the uh, Canary Islands where there are a lot of talented fighters training right now. And we will hear from Mr. DeBombe, who is standing by with our Steve Lewis. Yeah, congratulations. Uh, pleased to get the stoppage win. Yeah, it was a... Uh, I ripped my arms in the first one. <laughs> so I used only this. And <laughs> so it was... Uh, I couldn't be, be boxed better if I have the two of... Uh, Talking to your trainer, and he said it's an old injury that's flared up. What? A, a previous injury that you've had before? Yeah, a previous injury when I got the training. 
And the first one, I uh, give you a hook. So I use uh, only this hand. Part of, okay, you got that injury, so with one arm, that was a good performance, surely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Yeah, well, congratulations. Uh, you got all your friends and family waiting for you there. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on Fight Zone again. What? We, congratulations. You've got a lot of friends and family here, yeah. and we look forward to seeing you box on Fight Zone again. Yeah, thank you very much. I've got, I got a very strong team, good trainers. Good uh, sponsor, uh, on my on my friend, a very very strong team. Uh, thank you to to Lee Baxter, to John, to uh, Tony Bellew, and uh, to everyone who supports me. It means a lot. We'll have, we'll have to bring Tony back here next time. Uh, Tony Bellew will have to come here next time, won't he? Yeah, next time, maybe, maybe. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Well, coming up next, it is our co-main event, the vacant Canadian women's super bantamweight title on the line. Amanda Galley and Tanya Walters will go at it for the vacant strap. Complex. Let's hear it. Let's welcome former IBF welterweight and WBC silver lightweight middleweight champion, Kel Brook. Kel, come on up. Come on into the ring. Have a word with the fans. Come on up, Kel. Real deal and true champion. Let's hear it for Kel Brook, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. No, that. I'm just, I'm happy Lee's uh, invited me out here. It's a great card, a great show. I've come to see Sammy Vargas. Fight zone, Dennis Hobson, where are you? 
Yo, all the way from Sheffield, bye bye. We're here. We're here. I just thank you all. We're going to have a great show. We've had a great show tonight and uh, just carry on doing great, being great. Oh, let me a car. Kel, congratulations on a great career. Thanks for being with us. All the way from Sheffield, UK, the great Kel Brook. Right here for Lee Baxter Promotions. Four, minus one, that's three quick maths. Everyday man on the block. Smoke trees. See your girl in the park. That and boxing fans, cool. are you ready for the co-main event? Let's bring Tanya Walters to the ring. Tanya Walters. Down the sector, supreme neck protector. Better want him, kid, Mr. Messer. Born and pop, pop the blow his land from the pressure. Too hot for TV, for sheezy. Too many wanna be hard, be easy. It's all in the cover, going all out together. It don't take much to please me. Still, homes are never satisfied like the stones. We don't get don't write and see them selling cross bones. Protecting what I'm writing, don't clash with the titan. Who blast with a license to kill rap recitants? Come on, in the zone with your nigga from the group home to cow. Fuck your lifestyle, put your lights out. Get this shit to crack and got you feeling with your pipes out. Time for some action, surfing the avenue, mad at you, where I used the battle crew, back when that's when that had the attitude, cover me, I'm going in, walls closing in, got us busting off these pistols, my niggas got issues again, same song, on with the mega bomb, blow you out the frame, then I'm gone. Yo, I was going to, but we roam, cellular phones, stock map, back in the flesh, blood and bones, no condone, spin bank loans and homegrown, suckers break like turbo and ozone, when I grab the broom, moonwalk, platoon hawk, my goon spark, leave you in the blue lagoon, lost, true, we nines in the Club with mass suit, he died in the club, right behind on the bars. Haters don't touch, what? way it's both up. Now my neighbor doped up, got the cable hooked up. All channels, lift my shirt, all mammal. You ship off keys and we oh, ship man, grand piano. Sure. All shotgun, hand on the puck, sipping on the pool. Smoking on the puck. Vying for a Canadian women's super bantamweight title in just her third professional fight, Tanya Walters enters with a record of 2-0. and We last saw her in February of 2020. Scoring a four round decision over Erica Hernandez. A big step up, a big opportunity for Walters tonight here in Toronto. And fans, here, come, here comes her opponent, Amanda Gale. deal with Lee Baxter and Lou DiBella, who is an expert at maneuvering women towards world title shots. Tonight, she'll vie for a Canadian title. Let's send it up to Christian Gauthier for the official introductions. Lou Kotek with us in attendance here today. It is sanctioned by the National Championships of Canada, represented by Supervisor Jim Gentle of Toronto, sponsored by Everlast and Fight Zone. Presented by Lee Baxter Promotions. The officials for this contest. Timekeeper Jim Monkelbahn. Knockdown timekeeper Joe Bunag. Your three judges appointed at ringside to score this championship bout are Alan Davis, David Dunbar, and Jeremy Hayes. And when the bell rings, veteran referee Donovan Boucher will handle all the action. And now, here is tonight's co-main event, 
eight two minutes round of action for the NCC Canadian Super Bantamweight Championship. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing yellow with navy trim, official weight 117 pounds. She has scored a victory in both of her professional bouts. Introducing from Brampton, Ontario, Tanya Tank Walters. Across the ring, her opponent fights out of the red corner. She's wearing black with the red, white, and green Italian trim. She tipped the scale at 119.4 pounds. She is undefeated in five professional contests with a perfect five victories. Introducing from Mississauga, Ontario, Amanda Bumbala Gale. Donovan Boucher, referee with the instructions. Okay, ladies. I'm expecting a good, clean fight. Listen to my command at all times. Most, imp most importantly, protect yourself at all times. Touch glove, good luck to both of you. The Canadian Women's Super Bantamweight title on the line. And our co-main event is sponsored by Girls Just Want a Box, which is doing wonderful work making boxing more accessible and more inclusive for women across Canada and across the world. For more information, Log on to girlsjustwantabox.com. Amanda Galley and Tanya Walters here in our co-main event. Galley has fought for this title in the past against Shelly Barnett a couple of years ago. She weighed in slightly over the 122 pound limit, did Galley, so the title was ultimately not on the line, although she was dominant and impressive in that fight. So for all intents and purposes, she is the top dog here in this country at this weight. And it's Walters who's looking to show that she can stand in there with her. And Walters, Steve, we talked to her at the open media workout the other day. She's made, really not hiding what she needs to do in this fight. She said, I need to be on the inside. That is where I can win this fight. Like you said earlier, Amanda Gal has such an amateur pedigree, so deep with so many amateur fights. She's such a skilled fighter, and that is the best option for Tanya Walters is to get on the inside, rough her up, and make it look ugly, and, and try to throw Galley off her game plan of boxing from the outside. But it's a tough task, uh, Corey, because Amanda has so much experience, and she's just so well-skilled. It's going to be a tough task for Walters to throw off that game plan tonight. Walters says that in order to get to the inside, she needs to jab, she needs to feint, she needs to use angles because she won't be able to just walk in the front door and get to the inside. That's not something that Galley's just going to allow her to do. Good shot from Walters there, sneaks in, and a left hook. Good reply from Amanda Galley. <coughs> 10 seconds left. We gotta remember these are two minute rounds for the females, Corey. The tempo picks up, and it's been a good one here in the opening round.
Round two of our co-main event. Amanda Galley and Tanya Walters for the Canadian Women's Super Bantamweight title. Walters breaking a 750-day layoff. And Steve, you and I have talked about this on recent broadcasts as well, just how difficult it's been for Canadian fighters living in a, a country that has taken restrictions more seriously than most countries have globally. It's really shut off the valve for a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of fighters in this country who have either had to find their way out of it to go train somewhere else or kind of accept that you need to use this time to improve somehow when you're not actually in active competition. Yeah, it's something that I, you know, thankfully didn't happen during my career, but I mean, hats off to these fighters who stayed in the gym, who stayed active, who stayed with their promoters to get them fights outside of Canada. I know that Lee Baxter has some guys go to Mexico and whatnot, and these other promoters who get these guys fights. Um, hats off to both of them, but, you know, boxing is a tough sport. It's the loneliest sport in the world, so if you want to be at the, the top of the game and top of the world, you know, you got to fight through times like these. You mentioned Galley and her co-promotional deal with Lou DiBella. She was able to sneak in a fight in November of 2021, a six-round decision over Jaika Pavilis that in upstate New York. Some good body shots by Galley there. Now, Walters hasn't been able to quite get to the inside on Galley, but she is she has been able to make Galley work maybe a little bit more often than Galley would ideally want to. She's definitely holding her own, but Amanda's, I mean, laying the clean shots and rolling out to the side and using those feet to get out of there after the shots land. That was a good shot from Galley a moment ago, a right hand right underneath the left arm, high on the body of Tanya Walters. <laughs> Three begins of what's been a high tempo co main event here between Amanda Galley and Tanya Walters. Good left hook connects there from Galley a moment ago. Good body work from Galley as well. Excellent right, right hand. Now you see Walters just kind of forcing her way to the inside. And that's what Walter has to do. She has to force in there, her way in there. She has to make it look ugly and break the rhythm of Amanda Galley. Right hand from Galley a moment ago. Flores it gets back to the outside. Walters has got to let her hands go. She can't give time for Amanda Gallery to get set, to get positioned, to think about what she wants to throw. It's going to be a long, long night for her. She has to jump on top, top of her, throw shots and make it ugly just like that and keep her in that corner. For Amanda, when she has all this time to think and to box and to set up her shots, it's going to be a very easy night for her, and it's, it's not a lot of pressure for her to, to box like this. The sweeping left hook connects from Galley a second ago. Good body shot. Galley now 
Now trying to back up Walters, but Walters doing more of what she said she needed to do. Maybe a little sequence to build upon for the next round. Co-main event here rolls along. As Amanda, Amanda Galley put a pretty good round in the bank there. There was a moment at the end of the round where Walters kind of forced her way to the inside and landed a couple of shots. And in, in your opinion, Steve, does Walters basically just need to sell out and kind of tuck behind a high guard to get to the inside because um, she, she can't win the jab battle, it seems, on the outside. Yeah, she can definitely not get inside of Manigal's beautiful boxing, that beautiful jab. She does almost have to go for broke. I wouldn't say go for broke per se, but she needs to really step it up and take risk and to get on the inside and take calculated risk to make this fight turn towards her favor. Because she sits on the outside like this and just gets picked apart all night, she's not going to get the win. She has to change things, change the pace, and change the dynamic of this fight. and then flurries with a left hook that connects. Another key for Galley so far has just been her foot face. Just the threat of throwing a punch has been enough to sometimes freeze Walters on the outside. And then when she freezes, that's when Galley can just pick her apart, move angles, throw three and four punch combinations, and get out of there. And there was an example of that, although Walters was able to duck out of the way of a left hook. Good flurry to the body from Galley and back to the outside. Now from ringside, I'm watching the eyes of Amanda Galley, and there are times when she's almost watching the, the feet of Walter. She's looking downwards, kind of watching what she's doing, and is, has been able to time her pretty well. Because as long as she knows that those feet aren't moving towards her, she can just counter punch her and pick her apart from the outside. Round five begins. Amanda Galley vying for this Canadian Women's Super Bantamweight title for the second time. We mentioned the circumstances that resulted in her not walking away with that title when she defeated Shelly Barnett. A, a win that has aged pretty well. Shelly Barnett will be fighting in Los Angeles next week against Ramal Ali, another one of the rising stars in women's boxing. Flurry from Galley backs Walters off. We saw in Walters' corner, she's trained by Natasha the Nightmare Spence, the former world title challenger who fought 
Hannah Gabriels for a world title. Hannah Gabriels now, amazingly, the WBC Women's Heavyweight Champion. It's interesting watching Amanda Galley live for I think the third time now and knowing her background in karate where she's a fourth degree black belt, her feet and her ability to feint and dance in and out, it, it all kind of makes sense. Absolutely, it's beautiful to watch. Just the way she, she sets traps and use her, uses feints with her feet to, to freeze that Walter's right in her, in her tracks. Seconds tick away here in the fifth round. Six begins our co main event between Amanda Galley and Tanya Walters for the Canadian Women's Super Bantamweight title. It is a, a good era, a great era of women's boxing in Canada right now. Marie Eve DeCare just regaining her world title. Steve, you and I were able to call that fight. Kim Clavel, who fought earlier this week in Quebec, becoming star in her, her own right. Candy Wyatt recently fought for an undisputed, an undisputed world title against Jessica McCaskill. And then we have up-and-comers like Layla Baudouin, Mary Spencer, who recently turned pro as well. You know, we're gonna, we already are in a great era of Canadian women's boxing, but it's only going to improve. And names like Galley and Walters will certainly be around for years to come. Good sharp Chris shots by Galley. Yeah. So so far this whole fight's been Galley. She's been boxing from the outside beautifully, using the angles, dictating the pace of the fight. Walter just hasn't been able to get her where she wants her to get off and keep her on the ropes and accumulate any sort of damage. Because that's the only game plan that she had her. That would have been the ultimate game plan for her to be successful here tonight against Galley. Yeah, and, and Walters to me is not fighting poorly. I think that she's run into a, a a bad matchup for her. For a, a mover and a jabber like Galley is, is exactly, that's her kryptonite, I would think. Exactly, that's exactly what I mean, what I meant to say, Corgan. Like, she's not fighting a bad fight. She just can't get past the greatness of Amanda Galley and how Amanda Galley's experience is taking over the footwork, the ring generalship. She just can't get past that.
timeout seven begins. And just to illustrate the, the dedication that Amanda Galley has to improving and to fast tracking towards a world title, after her pro debut, she went on a quick vacation, but the week she came back, she had three sparring sessions already lined up just to keep her in check. That's right. a level of dedication that, that even other dedicated fighters wouldn't necessarily have. And I have to give a little, a little credit to her coach, Vito. I know her and her coach, Vito, have been a tight, tight team since day one. They've been together for a long, long time. Everyone knows that and they, they come as a package and they work very hard. So hats off to them as a team. Still here in the seventh round, the sharp, quick, dominant footwork by Amanda Gal gives her enough time to get away from the shots whenever Walters opposed an offensive threat. Right hand to the body from Galley a moment ago. Walters fires back, does land a jab there. Oh, good left hook rocks Walters back. <laughs> that was the best shot of the fight. Uppercut from Galley connects and another left hook. Walters does come back with a shot of her own. Best action of the fight so far here in round seven. And for Walters, frankly, she needs action. She's going to need something big. That's the only in the chance upcoming she has. Final two minutes, absolutely. That's the only chance she's going to have is catching Galley in the middle of a combination, catching her with a lucky shot. Because so far, it's been a shutout for Amanda Galley here tonight. is sponsored by Girls Just Want a Box. And Amanda Galley has been able to box her way pretty safely through the majority of the rounds here. But Tanya Walters, to her credit, looks like she is going for it here in the eighth and final round, and she's going to need it. She's going to need it for sure. This is what she should have did in the opening round, come out swinging, break the rhythm of Amanda Gal from her, from her boxing. Fortunately for Galley and unfortunately for Walters, this is kind of the perfect style matchup for Galley and maybe the wrong one for Walters. Especially in the last round, like you mentioned before, Amanda Galley is always in the gym. She never stops training. So the more that Walters comes, even though it's the eighth and final round, Amanda Galley wants that sort of action all night. right now just basically fainting and freezing Walters and avoiding the kind of chaos that might lead to, to a scary situation and, and what Walters needs right now. Walters trying to dig to the body. She has precious few moments on the inside. And you gotta give credit to Amanda Galley. She's won the first seven rounds. She has this fight in the bank, but she's not she's not running around, she's not moving away. She's stepping Walters, giving her hometown fans the fight that they, that they came here to see. And they show their appreciation. A 
terrific effort from Tanya Walters, but Amanda Galley just too quick and too precise all night long. But I, I have to say, and only Tanya Walters knows her body and what's possible for her, but Tanya Walters at 115 or 112 as opposed to 118 suddenly I think becomes a problem for a lot of fighters where she won't have to deal with a fighter as tall and as rangy as Amanda Galley, where maybe more frequently she could get to the inside. That's, that's always a possibility. I mean, I'm sure she'll sit back with her team. Like you said before, um, her team has a lot of experience in that corner. You see Gary Friedman also as well as an advisor to her. She's a strong team behind her. So something to think forward moving ahead. Amanda Galley, you mentioned, a very good ticket seller here in Ontario. A lot of fans came out to see her specifically here tonight. And part of that is, is Galley really has kind of a, she has a showy presence about her as well. She's playing to the crowd in between rounds. She's very aware of the entertainment aspect of her career. certainly seems like she's ready for a step up beyond just the domestic level, beyond the Canadian titles. Well, she definitely has the right team behind her, like you said earlier. Lou DiBella, Lee Baxter, she's a strong corner in there with her, so she's definitely on the right path to bigger and better things for her career. Well, the belt is in the ring, the scorecards are in the ring, and Christian Goche is ready to make this one official. Let's send it up to the center of the ring. Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of eight rounds of championship boxing, here are the judges' scorecards. Judge Davis scores this contest 80 to 72. Judges Dunbar and Hayes, Hayes both score it 78 to 74. All in favor of the winner by unanimous decision. A new NCC Canadian Super Bantamweight Champion, Amanda Bumbala. Entertainment Complex with a Canadian Women's Super Bantam weight title and an emotional moment for Amanda Galley who like so many fighters here in Canada had to do, endure a lot just to get back into the ring and a tremendous achievement for Galley who as we said of course this is a great achievement however I think she is ready for fights beyond this level and on the international stage. She definitely showed that here tonight. You know, her great boxing ability, great footwork, great ring generalship. She has a team behind her, so, you know I mean, the world's, uh, you know I mean, she had a lot of opportunities ahead for her. And for Tanya Walters, you know, I would be excited to see her back in the ring against a different opponent because you can envision a fighter like Walters with the way she wants to fight producing an absolute war with the right opponent. And I, with the, the, if a matchmaker could give her the right contest, she could absolutely produce a true barn burner. Absolutely, she took a, she had a great performance tonight, Tanya Walters, we can't take nothing away from her. It was just the greatness and the skill set of Amanda Galley and the experience of her that dominated the performance tonight. At a lower weight class, who knows what Tanya Walters is capable of. Coming up in just a few minutes, it is our main event. Sammy Vargas, Premislav Aronofsky. As Vargas bounces back from the knockout loss at the hands of Connor Ben, and is looking to prove here tonight that he still has some years left and can still challenge some top welterweights, some top prospects perhaps 
get back in the win column against Ranovsky, which is certainly no easy task. But right now, we're gonna hear from the new Canadian Women's Super Bantamweight Champion. We're gonna send it over to the third member of our broadcast team, Mr. Steve Lillis. Congratulations, uh, Canadian Super Bantamweight Female Champion. Is that the first of many? It's supposed to be the second, but it's the first one, absolutely. And uh, this was a stepping stone on, on the way to bigger and better things. So, um, talk us through the fight. You always seem very, very comfortable. Uh, I was a little bit nervous, a little bit more outside the ring pressure. I don't like having a pity party. Only my family and true, true fans know what's going on. But my mom's days are counted for. I should have brought this home two years ago. And because they're counted for and she doesn't have much time left, I had to be sure I made her proud. It wasn't too late, and I brought this home tonight. What's next for Amanda Galley? I'm gonna soak up this win. It, it's, it's been a lot of adversity. I'm her caregiver, I'm her daughter, and at the same time, I'm trying to work my way to a world champion. So I'm gonna soak this one in, and I'm gonna go back. I'm supposed to fight here in Toronto April 21st, and then back in New York with Dabella, and uh, hopefully, like I said, this is a national title, next is an international title, and slowly move up my way to a world ranking and a world championship of many, one of many. My ultimate goal is uh, undisputed champion in all seven divisions. Thank you for your time. It's main event time now, and back to Corey. Time now for our main event. Let's send it up to our ring announcer, Mr. Chris Gauthier. Boxing fans, we are set for tonight's main event. Let's welcome to the ring the first fighter. Let's hear it for Samislav Ronowski. dropping a 10-round unanimous decision to Michael McKinson in August of last year in the UK. He says he is a completely different person, a completely different fighter, heading into tonight's main event. And now here comes his opponent, Samuel Vargas! Time for the main event of the evening. Here's my 
one in their box and uh, bring them down with a body. You know, that's, that's what he's been. You've learned in the ring and in the gym, you face the best. Bonkers tries to run the point. He's pushing down the ball. Let's welcome him to the ring, Samuel Vargas! Hey, came in the game, get money. Flip chicks with get money. Get the plan with the money, put the bang for the money, change of money. You love to see it on the bottom. Catch it coming, gotta keep it on the low. Love blessing with a hoe. Wanna break it down in the 36 hours? Look at here. A homecoming for Samuel Vargas, who is looking to show that he can still be a factor in the 147 pound division. Much like yourself, Steve, Sammy Vargas has a lot to do with why nights like this can exist in Canadian boxing, because prior to you, prior to Sammy Vargas, we didn't have events like this. Sammy Vargas has been a trailblazer for fighters across this country. He has been him and Lee Vax with the team since day one. They've been putting on events, and Sammy's been putting on shows and putting on performances here in Ontario and abroad to grow a, to grow a, a following here in Ontario. Ontario Athletic Commission and Commissioner Luke Kotek with us in attendance tonight is sanctioned by the International Boxing Organization represented at ringside by Supervisor Ohe Alonso from Florida, USA. This Lee Baxter Promotions event is sponsored by Everlast and Fight Zone. Subscribe to Fight Zone now and get your first three months free. Go to fightzone.uk. The officials for this contest, timekeeper Jim Monkelban, knockdown timekeeper Joe Bunag. Your three judges appointed at ringside to score this championship contest are Martin Dalada, Alan Davis, and Jeremy Hayes. And when the bell rings, veteran championship referee Mark Simmons will handle all the action. And now, for those in attendance here at Rebel Entertainment Complex in beautiful downtown Toronto, and for the thousands watching live on Fight Zone, here is the featured bout of the evening, 10 rounds of action for the IBO International Welterweight Championship. <laughs> Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing red with white trim, official weight, 155.4 pounds. His professional record stands at 19 victories, including five big wins by knockout and two defeats. Introducing from Slops, Poland, Polska, Semislav Koshash Ronowski. Across the ring, his opponent fights out of the red corner. He is wearing black with the gold trim. He tipped the scale at 152.2 pounds. He has an impressive professional record of 31 victories, including 14 big wins by knockout, seven defeats, and two draws. From Bogota, Colombia, now fighting out of Toronto, Ontario, introducing a former 
NABA welterweight champion, Samuel Vargas. Once again, referee Mark Simmons with the instructions. Boxers, we went over the instructions in the dress room. I want a good, clean fight. Obey my commands at all times. Shorts are good, touch gloves. Good luck to the both of you. Well, there is some continuity here in our main event. We mentioned that Ranofsky lost to Michael McKinson last time out. Two fights ago, Sammy Vargas lost to Virgil Ortiz Jr. Those two will fight next week, but the winner of this fight believes that they can get back in the mix at 147 and still have hopes of some profitable and big fights at welterweight. And right off the bat, Ronofsky heading straight towards Sammy Vargas, which is the opposite of what he did against Michael McKinson. And McKinson was mainly able to back him up for 10 rounds. As we know about Sammy Vargas, ideally, he wants to be the aggressor. He doesn't want to be the aggressor, Corey, but I've known Sammy a long, long time. He's not the guy who's going to come out here and blast him out in the first round. He's going to get a feel for the guy's power, get a feel for the guy's punches, and slowly break him down by laying him body shots like that on the inside. Vargas has faced so many top names during his career. Luis Colazzo, Amir Khan, Danny Garcia, Errol Spence, Ali Funica. Certainly trying to erase the memory of his last outing against Connor Ben when he was stopped in the first round. Marcus felt that he might have been caught cold in that fight, and also, as we've talked about in earlier contests, not an ideal situation for a Canadian fighter at that point in time in terms of training to go and face a guy like Connor Ben. Yeah, with the world shut down, I'm sure it's tough. There we go. Sam landed some left hooks on the inside. Ranofsky and his team, they said they feel like they're catching Vargas at the right time. And they feel that if they could beat Vargas, and if they can stop him like they say that they can, they want to go after Conor Ban immediately afterwards. on the outside here from Ranofsky. Ranofsky's got a good, firm jab from the outside when he does throw it. He does, and that's going to be the best thing for him tonight is to stay on the outside and not let a guy like Vargas get on the inside and get on his chest and rough him out. Ranofsky's got to stay on the outside, box and move, and Vargas obviously got to cut that ring off with body shots, dig upstairs and dig down, and make it a tough, ugly, rough fight. That should be the game plan for both men here tonight. Two begins. A little bit of a feeling out process for both Vargas and Ranofsky in the first. Right hand connects from Ranofsky. Right 
from ringside here, Steve. Ronofsky certainly fills out a welterweight frame quite well. He's a, a firm, solid 147. He looks a lot wider than Vargas, but Vargas is a lot thicker this way than, than with than uh, Ronofsky. Good left hook connects from Ronofsky. Important to note as well, as we're talking about the weight, that because this fight was sanctioned by the IBO, there was a 147-pound weigh-in the day prior. Then these fighters re-weighed in here today at 157, so only had a 10-pound difference. For the Ontario Athletic Correct. Commission. Correct, yes. And that's the way to beat the same-day weigh-in for these bigger title right. fights. But at the same time, there are certainly welterweights that would gain more than 10 pounds overnight, and this puts a stop to that. I'd like to see Sammy fire that jab a little more. I know he's just trying to cut the ring off with Ronofsky, but he's just walking towards him. He's got to throw shots so he can't get hit with counter shots. Ronofsky landed an uppercut a moment ago. You're starting to see some redness on the face of Sammy Vargas. Both guys exchanging good jabs there. Talking to Vargas's team, they feel that they can break Ranovsky mentally. And they feel that perhaps that's a, a weak point. And we mentioned during Ranovsky's entrance that he feels that it was a weak point. But they think that by continuously applying pressure, by using those pivots on the inside, that ultimately Ranovsky will just run out of ideas. And I agree with Vargas in his camp. You know, Sammy's just such a constant pressure and such a constant force. He never stops coming. And, I mean, this is a, a big stage for him to, to prove where he's at in his point of his career. So it's going to be a lot for Ranovsky to keep moving all night. And it's going to be a lot, of, it's going to be a lot for Ranovsky to to keep Vargas off him for 10 full rounds. I know Sammy Vargas is always, always in top shape with coach Billy Martin. So he's gonna have to be on his bike for 10 full rounds, moving away from the force and power shots of Sammy Vargas. That's a big, a big question to ask if he can do that. Good right hand connects there from Ronofsky. Vargas shakes his head. But certainly we all saw that shot landing. Good action there in the second frame. underway of what has been a competitive main event here so far between Sammy Vargas and Premis Lavronovsky. Two guys fighting to get back into the conversation around the fringes of 147. And really, this fight will be very instructive for where Vargas is at in his career because historically, it's taken top level fighters to beat Sammy. At this level, he's almost always been victorious. So if he's not victorious against Ronovsky, we kind of have to start asking some questions about where Sammy's at. I really think, like you said, Corey, this is going to be a big night for both gentlemen in the direction of where their career goes after tonight and after the performances here tonight. Yeah, and this is a, what we would describe as a crossroads fight, a true crossroads fight in boxing here between Vargas and Ronovsky. Ronovsky says that he turned down more lucrative offers in terms of money to take this fight because he felt that Vargas was a good name and he felt that he was a beatable opponent even going on the road to Vargas' hometown.
Good defense there from Vargas getting out of the way of a jab then out of the way of that big sweeping right hand from Ranovsky. Five thirty seconds or so, purely moving, just moving. Moving on his bike, and that's that's a tough task to do for ten full rounds against a guy like Vargas who keeps coming. And it goes to show who's in control of this fight. In control of this fight so far, maybe a close fight, but Sammy Vargas is definitely in control. He's dictating the pace. Oski gets back to work, but he is now cut. leaking blood. And I didn't see a clash of heads there, Steve. We're gonna wait, maybe for the official to make a ruling. Sammy Vargas calls him on. But that blood seems to have emboldened Vargas. And again, I didn't see a ruling about a clash of heads. Oh, big right hand connects there from Ronofsky. It's certainly live in the crowd here at the Rebel Entertainment Complex. It may not have been a dominant performance for Sammy Vargas, but that was definitely a very, very good round for him. Romanovs, he's cut, he's on the ropes, the crowd's getting involved. That's a very good round for Sammy Vargas. Well, I think a good round for Sammy, maybe mentally more than anything, yes. because even if you did score that round the other way, the body language of Sammy Vargas completely changed in those last 40 seconds or so. Yes, it did. of our main event and maybe a turning point in this contest towards the end of round three the cut opening up over the right eye of Premislav Ranovsky and the demeanor of Sammy Vargas and the demeanor of the crowd here entirely changed a low blow but a good check left hook by Sammy Vargas in that exchange a flurry to the body there from Vargas immediately afterwards and a nice right hand by Sammy Vargas. Sammy starting to find his range in there, Corey. And Ranovsky now on his bike, maybe affected by that right hand, and he eats another one. Ranovsky looking like a fighter in turmoil right now, holding on, finding himself on the perimeter. And again, remember the promise from Vargas and his team that they would be able to break Ranovsky mentally. And like I said, I know that's a promise that Vargas and his team can come through with. I've trained with this kid since his first day in the boxing gym. I've trained with Billy Martin. I know their mentality and what they're capable of. And there's no doubt that Sammy Vargas is able to break Ranovsky down mentally as he's doing here, right here in this round. Ranovsky looks for a check left hook that was blocked by Vargas, who is now just walking him down. And Ranovsky looking a little bit more desperate with his offense. He's firing those right hands, but he doesn't look as sure about what he's doing as he was in those opening three rounds. And that's all he's got is the one, two, and he just stands there. He's not moving out or throwing in a three after that. He's just hoping to land that big two. And this rough housing tack and this dirty boxing by Sammy, all it does is it continue to break, to break uh, Ronofsky down. 
Well, in talking to Vargas' trainer, Billy Martin, prior to the fight, he said, listen, we watched Ronofsky's fight against Michael McKinson, and a oh, good right hand there from Ronofsky. But they watched as McKinson, who's not the same fighter as Vargas, who's a little slicker, but not nearly as physical as Vargas. It doesn't work on the inside. And McKinson was able to walk Ronofsky down. We feel that if he could do it, we could do it a lot easier. And they couldn't be more correct. They call him Sammy the Bull for a reason because this guy's a bull. He is as tough as nails and he won't stop coming. He won't give up. His conditioning is always great with trainer Billy Martin. And another big round, I thought, for Sammy Vargas. Five begins, and Ronofsky comes out with a big right hand to open the round, but Vargas walks through it and walks him back to the ropes. After the cut opened up over the eye of Premislav Ronofsky, the tenor of this fight entirely changed. Other right hand connects from Ronofsky. We mentioned in the previous round that the offense from Ronofsky feels a little bit more desperate right now. Last round, that might have been a bad thing, but right now, he's fighting with the kind of urgency that he probably needs. And he landed some nice, a few crisp, crisp, nice right hands early in this round. But again, we have to remember, Sammy Vargas is taking the right hands from the likes of Danny Garcia, Errol Spence, top-notch guys like that before in his life. That said, we can't forget what happened to Sammy last time out. Of course, getting stopped by Conor Ben in the first round. But perhaps in taking those shots, that's actually a confidence boost for Vargas to eat a shot like that and realize, yeah, I'm still okay, I'm still here, I still have a chin. And we gotta remember, though he took those shots and he got caught up in the ropes, he wasn't sleeping, he wasn't out cold, he wasn't, you mean, unconscious. Right. He was caught up in the ropes. Where I think if Conor Ben unleashed a fury of those shots, as did Chris, as he did to Chris Algieri, you're gonna be sleeping face first in the mat. Right hand along the belt line there from Ronofsky. Another straight right hand in the body. This is a much better round for Ronofsky. You still get the sense that he's working a lot harder to do what he wants to do than Sammy is, but to this point, he has done the better work in this round. In this round he has, but he is having to do work a lot harder because Sammy's doing what he wants to do. Sammy's walking him around the ring, pushing him around, roughhousing him and doing what he wants. So Romanovsky has to do a lot more to get done what he wants to do. Ooh, a weird sequence there a second ago. Ronofsky touched the ground? Touched the ground, probably not a knockdown, but Vargas was able to just continue throwing shots. And referee Mark Simmons didn't step in once. One of the things I've learned about Sammy Corey growing up and being with him so much, Sammy, sure he's an offensive and aggressive fighter. Sammy has great defense. He rolls with a lot of shots. He keeps his hands up. He knows how to catch shots and roll them very well. He doesn't sit there and take shots like some brawler. A trio of right hands have landed there from Ronofsky and a good uppercut as well. You know, I think this has been a good round for Ronofsky. Again, as we, as we mentioned, he had to work hard to do a lot of that. Can he keep it up the rest of the fight? We don't know, but I think that was a round for Ronofsky. I couldn't agree with more that Corey landed the gooder, the, the nicer, cleaner shots. Vargas was applying pressure, but there wasn't just enough firepower behind those shots. I 
after five rounds, it's been a very, very entertaining fight here in the main event. Round six underway. Likely the best round of the fight for Prevoslav Ranovsky, and he drops Vargas with a big left hook. Sammy was backing out with his right hand down. He got caught by a nice left hook from Ranovsky. The air just came out of the crowd here at Rebel, and Ranovsky is all over Vargas, who's trying to bob and weave out of trouble here. Sammy's shaking his head no. And now seconds after a knockdown, it's Vargas, chasing. who's the one chasing Ranovsky around the ring. Getting admonished by referee Mark Simmons as Ranovsky will be afforded a slight break for a low blow. Right hand connects from Ranovsky and he comes behind it with another big left hook. Another right hand connects from Ronovsky. You know, Ronovsky landing good clean shots, but Vargas do not take him out of the equation. He's landing little body shots. He's still moving forward, and he's taking Romanovsky's shots a lot better than he was earlier in this round. Yeah, I think the best way to describe it is over the last two rounds, Vargas is still dictating the tempo. He's dictating where this fight is being fought, but Ronovsky is still managing to land the best shots. That body shot hurt Romanovsky. As the cut opens up a little bit wider over the eye of Ronovsky. And Ronovsky, as, as you mentioned, he looks hurt to the body. <laughs> the he lingering effects hurt to of the that body, body shot. And Sammy Vargas smells now it. What a round here in our main event. Sammy the Bull Vargas. Vargas tasted the canvas early in this round, but the, right now... The intensity of Samuel Vargas is just too much for Romanovsky. A tremendous round. Vargas up off the deck to hurt Ronovsky at the end of that round, and maybe only the bell prevented something worse for Ronovsky. And let me tell you one thing, Corey, it's one thing to get dropped with a quick headshot and a quick check right hook. It's another thing to, to run around the ring scared and in pain from a painful body shot. And Sammy knows it, and best believe Sammy will not let off the gas when it comes to ripping those body shots here in round number seven. Right after the bell. A big right hand to start this round to seven off. 
What action we're getting here in our main event. Sammy Vargas, Premislav <coughs> Ranovsky, Corey Yerdman, and Steve Molitor on the call for you here tonight. And this has been a good one. Momentum swings all throughout this fight as Vargas tries to make good on his promise that ultimately he will break Ranovsky down. And it looked, Steve, in the previous round like he was on the cusp of doing that minutes after getting dropped himself. Another good body shot by Romanowski followed by a left hook. Sammy just has to be conscious of his defense. I know he's following him around and laying there and putting the pressure on him. He just has to be defensively aware as he steps toward Romanovsky. But Romanovsky does not like the intensity and the pressure that Sammy Vargas is putting on him. He cannot handle it. Romanovsky gets clipped with a right hand, standing right in Vargas' corner. He comes back with an uppercut of his own. As you mentioned, there's a lot of sneaky work being done by Vargas, those scoop uppercuts to the body, these little chopping shots on the inside. And we call it dirty boxing, and all it does is it just breaks you down slowly over the rounds because it keeps breaking you down, sucking the energy out of you, getting punched in the arms. It, it sucks the life out of you, and Sammy's great at doing that. Grabbing him, pulling him, hitting him just like he is in there. Ranovsky trying to find a way out on the inside there. And again, just getting chipped away, chipped away at by Vargas, who lands a good right hand along the belt line, climbs and the, the ladder with another And the constant body one. work is crumbling and crushing Premslav Romanovsky. And now a balloon has entered the ring, but good hands there from Mark Simmons. Former Olympian, Commonwealth Games gold medalist. Yeah, he hasn't lost his hand speed. And that will be a rule to slip. But Ranovsky struggling a little bit to get to his feet. The exhaustion. And nothing worse than being in. seven rounds into a fight with a guy like Sammy Vargas and getting pushed to the ground and having to pull yourself up off the canvas. Vargas getting warned, maybe for a push, a late shot. Doing everything he can to break down Ronofsky. Well, after seven rounds, Corey, now I remember why I love watching Sammy Vargas fight, why it's so important for him to fight here in his hometown of Toronto. Um, great for the city and great for boxing here in Ontario. saw in Ronovsky's corner. We've talked a lot about Vargas's trainer, Billy Martin, all night. Ronovsky's trainer, and Tony, and Tony Palucci, excuse me. Well, he was an outstanding super heavyweight as an amateur who would have gone to the Olympic Games in 1984 had Poland not boycotted. And he was Andrew Galata's sparring partner for his run at the 1988 Olympic Games. And round eight begins. Vargas and Ronovsky, it has been an excellent one here live on Fight Zone. And it's fights like these that have given Vargas the longevity that he's had. Big right hand connects right on the chin of Vargas, and we almost watched him shake that off in real time. What a right hand to just walk right through. Shows the heart and toughness of Sammy Vargas. That was a flush right hand on the chin.
You could see that right hand land and Vargas in real time kind of shake his head and almost wake himself back up. I do not know how he took that one and remained on his feet. I know we've talked about all night, Corey, on how tough and how aggressive Sammy can be, but do not forget or do not mistake for one second, this kid grew up side by side with me. Sammy knows how to box. He's very, very smart. He's very well educated in there. We should also give credit to Ronofsky right now because, you know, we sort of floated that storyline of Vargas thinking that he could mentally break Ronofsky, but Ronofsky's been hurt, he's been cut, and he's still here landing good shots. Sammy playing to the crowd, calling Ronofsky to come fight him. Vargas has certainly put Ronofsky through hell physically, but he's yet to break him fully mentally here. I'd like to see Sammy get back to that vicious, aggressive body work that got him to where it got him in this fight. Had Romanovsky in trouble and running on the ropes. It was due to those body shots. Vargas getting back to that double jab, trying to find his way to the inside. Or he most certainly has the advantage in this matchup. Good shot to the body there from Ronofsky. Combination up top. Vargas says no. Well, one thing for sure, Corey, I know we talked about it before this fight started. I don't think neither of these guys are ready to say goodbye to the sporter on their way out. And now, we've got blood on our notes. Did we get any on our jackets? We're going to have to hit up the dry cleaner after this, Steve. Whose blood is it? That's another good question. <laughs> I'm going to guess that it's Renovsky's. Final six minutes here of our main event, a 10 round welterweight affair, and it has been one heck of a fight. We haven't talked about it so much, Corey, but this might, um, scoring wise, how do you have this fight so far? I mean, it is very difficult to score and <laughs> call a fight simultaneously. Uh, this, I, listen, this would be a very difficult one to score. A lot of momentum swings. I will say that. The most eye-catching shots throughout the fight have been landed by Ronofsky, but the tempo has often been set by Sammy Vargas. He's been busier, and he's been the one backing Ronofsky up, but that isn't how you score fights necessarily. I I it's think, really difficult. I think the clear, more um, eye-catching shots have been from Ronofsky, but the volume and the tempo has been from Vargas, so definitely a tough fight to score, and definitely two big rounds up on the table as we're here in round number eight. Sorry, last three rounds. with one hand free, just hammering away with left hooks to the head. Right where that cut continues to gush from the outside of the right eye of Premislav Ronofsky. Ronofsky comes in with a right hand, comes behind it with a left hook. Now Vargas again, some more mind games here, trying to wave Ronofsky in. And when fighters do that, Steve, when, when you're kind of waving your opponent in like that, it's 
guess it's almost like you're, you're you're embarrassing your opponent in a little bit. You're, you're forcing them to say, no, I don't want to come to you. I don't feel like fighting right now. I can go 50-50. There's also the tale that, you know, I mean, the sh what you're doing is affecting the fighter and you're breaking him down mentally. That's why he has to try to change up the pace and ask you to come at him. And now Vargas just forcing the issue. He's not asking anymore. He's going after Anofsky, who is leaking blood right now. And as we mentioned, some of it has been spilled on our notes. Oh, and now the cut over the right eye of Vargas as well. Starting to pour down the right cheek. Right hand connects from Ronofsky. Nice drop from Vargas there. Some showmanship from both men at the end of round number eight. Sorry, round number nine. Both men wearing crimson masks heading to their corner as we inch towards the 10th and final round. Sammy Vargas and Premislav Ranovsky. Both men have been hurt. Vargas has been dropped. Both men looking to stay alive in the upper reaches of the 147 pound division. Right hand comes over the top from Ranovsky. Both men just trading in the center of the ring. comes over the top from Vargas. And it's almost like there's a tacit agreement right now between these two that we're gonna slug this out to the final bell. You know, both guys know what a close fight it is. They know what's on the line. They know what it, their future's in debt or on the line. They're both giving it their all here in the 10th and final round. Both true to the word that they're gonna come here to win and fight their hardest and give it their all. Good left hook connects there from Vargas. Ranofsky comes back with a right hand. Both men have eaten solid shots here in the 10th and final round. Vargas has got up off the canvas, shook off a big left hook that knocked him down. Ranofsky shook off being badly hurt to the body at basically running away to survive in the very same round. Vargas and Ranofsky trading jabs there. Jab from Vargas lands right on Ranofsky's cut. Well, it's been the story of the fight, Corey. Vargas is pressing forward the whole fight. Body shots, head shots, and Ravanowski laying those clean, crisp shots when he's decided to stop and box. Just like that, a nice right hand. Double jab and a right hand from Ranofsky. Vargas trying to invite Ranovsky to fight here. Ranovsky just holds on. Vargas looking a little bit frustrated. Final 10 seconds. Both men bloodied. Ranovsky now potentially hurt in the final seconds. Not enough time for Vargas to capitalize, but boy, 
boy, oh boy, what a main event. What a great main event and a great performance by both men here. And you could tell that Ronofsky was hurt. Ronofsky just doubled over and spit his mouthpiece out onto the canvas right as this fight ended. If Vargas had maybe 10 more seconds, we might have had a game-changing moment for him, but as it stands, this will be in the hands of the judges. Like I told you from the get-go, Corey, the intensity and the non-stop relentless effort from Sammy Vargas, it's overwhelming. I don't care who you are, it can become overwhelming, and Sammy showed that here tonight. And I think it played in his favor, and in my eyes, he should get a 10-round uh, decision, but that's in the hands of the judges. this a crossroads fight, which is to suggest that the winner of this goes on and the other kind of has to reconsider things. But Steve, I think this fight was good enough, it was close enough that both of these guys will get some opportunities out of this main event. You couldn't be more uh, right there, Corey. Both men put on such a great performance tonight that who, what promoter, what fight fan would not want to see these two guys fight in their next fight? And maybe even fight one another. I'll watch that again. I'll watch that again. I maybe won't wear a light jacket next time. <laughs> I might wear black. <laughs> Looks like we are moments away from making this one official. Some tense moments here for both camps. All right, let's and send it up to Chris Goche to make this one official. Action. We now go to the judges' scorecards. Judge Hayes scores this contest 97 to 92. Judges. Dalada and Davis both score it 98 to 91, all in favor of the winner by unanimous decision. And new IBO International welterweight champion, Semislav Koshash Ronaski. Here in the main event, 97-92, 98-91 twice. That's very disappointing, Corey. I think I we can have some debates about those scores. Well, let's set that aside for just a moment. Premislav Ronowski with the biggest win of his career coming on the road to defeat Sammy Vargas in his main event, or in the main event, excuse me. There'll be some good opportunities that'll come for Ronowski coming out of this. That said, those scores feel quite wide, wide for me. Very, very wide for me as well. And I'm not even suggesting that you couldn't have scored this fight for Ronofsky. I, 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 don't think, yeah, I think you absolutely could have, but 98-91 twice, particularly for me. Eight uh, rounds and two, I just don't feels, see it. Yeah, I just don't I, see it. It didn't feel like the fight that I just watched. Well, I think, the, I think the fans had a good time. I think both Vargas and Ronofsky had a good time. I'd like to see that fight run back again. Well, Ronofsky is managed by Martin McCollajack, who has become somewhat of an upset specialist. In particular, he helped guide Shondell Winters through his incredible 2019, when he upset two heavyweight prospects back to back, and he got himself a fight on his own against Joseph Parker. And he has just guided another fighter to a shocker of an upset here in Toronto. And in just a few moments, we're gonna hear 
from Sammy Vargas and Premislav Ranovsky. That'll be it for me and Steve. We're going to send it up to the third member of our broadcast team, Mr. Steve Willis. Vargas is just talking to Steve Molitor. Steve certainly doesn't seem to like the decision. Samuel. Sammy. Well, how did you, a tough fight, a close fight it looked. What did you think? Uh, you know, it, it was a, it was an entertaining fight. It was just, I, I, it was a little me chasing him. And, and when you have to chase somebody, you know, you open to, you open yourself up a little bit. There, there was no fight. I just had to chase him and chase him, chase him. Uh, I don't know what the judges were seeing. I mean, everyone, every, all the fans here are telling me I won. Everyone's really upset. Uh, I'm not even upset at the decision because I just, I knew I won the fight. I knew I won the fight. Uh, I just, you know, with, with the gauze and, 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 and regulations here with the, with, with, the, with, the, with the hand wraps, my hands were destroyed after the fourth or fifth round. I couldn't really steal my punches. But, uh, I mean, listen, I'm happy to be back. I mean, what can I say, man? I'm, you, can't, you can't take my, my win away. The judges, the judges, the judges, and that's it. Where does that leave your career now? Have you got to push for the rematch? Uh, you know, after this, I'm happy I made my comeback home and I can uh, happily walk away from the sport. Well, if you walk away from the sport, it's not been a bad career. It's something you can look back on with a great pride. Yeah, I mean, listen, uh, I've, I've, I've been in there with champions, with legends. I've traveled the world. Uh, I've met uh, awesome people like, like yourself, people in the lead backs of motions, my trainers. Uh, and, I, and I have so many mem memories along the way. I have two kids. I met my, my girl through boxing, uh, you know, everything, everything. Is, it's a blessing for me. You know what, well, it's been a great career. Don't make any decision too quick. You go, I have a good couple of weeks off before you do anything. Oh, no, no, I, I, I am telling you, I am telling you. After this, after this, I, I, I am, I am, I'm done. I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm living in, I'm not living on a bad note. I'm happy, I, I genuinely thought I won the fight. In my heart, I won the fight. I still have a smile on my face. Uh, but the judges, so what they judge, I don't care for the belt and everything like that. But, you know, I'm happy to be back and see everybody in the city. And uh, it just sucks that I didn't get the decision, but it is what it is. It's boxing. If it is your final fight, thanks very much for entertaining Fight Zone viewers. I know they would have loved it. No, no, yeah, man. Like, I want to say thanks to all the fans, all my sponsors, everyone that followed me in my career. Uh, my promoter, Lee Baxter. And, uh, yeah, no, this is, this is my last hoorah for sure. No, no, um, no turning back here. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you, guys. Well, that wraps up this evening. Samuel Vargas has lost a controversial decision. Will he be back? We'll wait and see. He doesn't seem so sure. It's been a great night of boxing here at what is just a stunning venue here in Toronto. Thanks very much for joining us on Fight Zone. We're back on Saturday when our cameras will be in Newcastle. <laughs>